So we're missing Maureen. She's there. Uh, Maureen's there. there. Yeah, Maureen's there. Where? Uh, there somewhere. I just there saw she her. is, right side up here. <laughs> In the bushes. It's easier if I don't have to wait through the audience as well as the council members to find who's here. But one of the other things I've found that helps is to make the whole, I shrink my screen and put it up higher. And then I can, everybody gets smaller and I can see everybody. And <clears throat> anyway, it just seems to help. Well, yeah. I have absolutely no problem with seeing everybody on my screen. I just prefer to see all of council at the top, not mixed in with everybody else. That's all. I can mute my video if that's better. I think we can well, just wait till I'm called. Is that better? That would be great. Thanks, Richard. Okay. Yeah. So we're ready to go, Mayor Ander, whenever you are. We're live on YouTube. Great. So. Thank you very much. We've got everybody. Well, welcome, everybody. And thank you, all the members of the public, for showing up. This is uh, the revised agenda for a regular council meeting on Monday, March 22nd, 2021. And I'm um, going to open the council meeting. And the first uh, thing on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Late items, Hope? Uh, yes, there are a number of late items. Um, I think nine in t or 10 in total. And they were all in regards to the temporary use permit. And those were circulated um, to council earlier today around 4 p.m. And they'll be included in the revised agenda tomorrow. Okay. Move to approve that, uh, the agenda. I'll move it. Okay. I see Rob there and all in favor, aye. Aye. Okay, I think that's got it, Hope, eh? And uh, we're going to move on to public comments. And I just, uh, just before we go there, and I'll just uh, remind council that we have till 9.30 tonight, and then we're going to have to uh, extend if we have to. This is quite a, com quite a comprehensive agenda tonight. So just keep that in mind. And I will also remind uh, the people on the the public comments that uh, we've given it 15 minutes. I think Hope has eight or nine on there. So I really would like uh, everybody to try to keep it down to two minutes. I know there's a lot of people that have written in letters. And um, if you could just be a little bit more concise, uh, the letters are all on the agenda. So there's no real reason to... Uh, to read them in the public comments, but do what you have to do. But I just, I will warn you in two minutes. So thank you and hope, go ahead. Thank you, Mary Ander. Um, first up, we have Mike Lightbody and it's regarding the development variance permit for 1195 Fairweather. Okay. Hello, Mike. Good evening, folks, Mayor, Council, uh, staff. Thanks for all your help on this. Uh, busy evening, I'll be quick. You have an application, actually two for me tonight uh, in fair weather. One of them has got some um, confusion. I'd just like to clarify very quickly here. I, I, confusion's a big word, but I'd like to bring some specific attention when this comes up tonight. 1195 fair weather. We are asking for a relaxation to site coverage. It is not to build a larger house than is permitted. It's to fit it within a series of site constraints that relate to, uh, and I'll just quickly list them out here. Stream setback, ocean setback, the existing foundation because the house burned down 10 years ago, the existing tram that we're going to be reusing, the existing concrete access stair that we're reusing, the roughed in driveway that was built to deal with the fire and the removal afterwards. We're putting a new driveway over top of that rubble the existing trees and the existing steep rock bluff that we are trying to hug up against. But specifically, we are not asking for a relaxation to the size of the building. What we're looking for is the ability to craft it into these constraints so that it fits within the existing elements on the property and doesn't turn into a, a big box and potentially larger. So that's my nutshell. Just wanted to bring that to your attention when it comes up. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, next is Andre Shalot regarding the temporary use permit um, item 6.1. All right, thanks Hope. Go ahead, Andre. Hello, hello. Uh, uh, Andre Shalot, 1425 West Side Road, uh, certified horticulturist in 1950, 1959, 
with a, uh, uh, have a, uh, a French ministry, uh, at the Minister of Agriculture uh, diploma. Okay. Uh, uh, your worship, ladies and gentlemen, councillors, greetings, and thank you for your attention. As I would like to clarify any misunderstanding regarding the application for TUP 2021-0017 for a side reuse at 620 Laura Road that I strongly oppose. While I am asking you to register the Riley Zappel Collection Orchard as a Bowen Island heritage site to be forever protected from mismanagement given its in inestimable legacy value to Bowen Islanders. I oppose the temporary use permit 2021-017 for all the misrepresentation represented in the application regarding the establishment of a commercial industrial agro-touristic business not permitted in the rural residential zoning where it is already operating at the total disregard of its impact on the neighborhood. Anne and I were the first to settle on the first phase of the Sunset Estate development. Westside and Laura Road didn't exist yet. And the logging road access from Bowen Bay Road to a dead end known for its drinking and target shooting practice destination is now our driveway. I have provided the factual prospect of apple production of all fruit trees at 620 Laura Road in a letter that you have all received. The 200 cider apple tree orchard planted two years ago by the present owner will not produce for another four to seven years at best. Whatever will be the production afterwards still need to be estimated. The collection orchard planted by John Riley may have 1,000 trees, not even 10% being cider apples. Half of the trees are still too young to produce, and the estimated production for all the others is at the most 5,000 pounds, 2,500 kilo. It takes five pounds uh, of apple for a liter of apple juice. Therefore, a total optimum production of 1,000 liters. At the council meeting of February 22nd, we were told that a minimum of 20,000 liters is needed. Andre, sorry, yeah. that's a two minute call. Try to wrap it up, please. Thank you. Okay. Is that it? You could have had a few, a few oh, more oh, seconds. Oh, I'm <laughs> here. I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you were told, you telling me to stop. No, no, I don't. Okay. I will just... finish very quickly anyway. The, yeah. the 20,000 liters have to come from somewhere. And, uh, and 19,000 liters, we don't know where they will come from. And I don't know where the 25, 75% proposed by the planner where, uh, where it is. 20,000 liters of cider, of, uh, cider represent 40,000 bottles of half a liter, the usual standard size of commercial sale of that kind of beverage. Is this cottage industry? In any way, I, would, I will end on a personal note. I would like to add that as I have known the Riley's Orchard much better than Bob Purdy and Christine Hardy will ever know, will ever do, given the thousands of hours I spent freely forming or restructuring every single tree of it and controlling their growth, their health during 27 years. I helped John Riley uh, succeed in his development as he was a neophyte in that field as a certified accountant. Being a very hardworking person, he learned by trial and error, reading on all aspects of the culture of apple trees and taking note of everything he was told and didn't know. To, the, uh, to be rewarded today by the frantic atmosphere of a tourist trap that are wineries, cideries, is very depressing. The educational and legacy value of the orchard are being replaced by a money-making vision of it, enough to make me regret my post-involvement. I will become very, it will be very difficult for me to even attempt walking on West Side Road outside my property on summer days without risking being run over now that I'm hard of hearing and nearly blind. That is what you will allow in granting that permit. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Andre. And let's try to keep a little closer to the two minutes, please, if you could, people. Hope. Oh. Uh, Anne Frank DeFerrier is next. Hello, Anne. Where you go? Uh, my name is Anne Frank DeFerrier, and I live at 1425 West Side Road. Your worship and counselors, I am a retired professional geoscientist 
and a retired registered on-site wastewater practitioner. I want to use this presentation to bring two important points to your attention. One, the disposal of all waste and the ma ma manufactured quantity of cider. In their letter dated March 18th, Rob Purdy and Christine Hardy mentioned, I quote, water use and wastewater. Vancouver Coastal Health is engaged and we are currently working through their approval process. We are required to have their approval in order to be open to the public. They enforce the following regulation, Drinking Water Protection Act, Sewage System Regulation, Food Premises Regulation, end of quotation. Maybe I am misunderstanding, but to me, it implies that no documentation regarding on-site waste water has been provided to the municipality for this top 2021 dash 0017 application. For your information, 620 Lower Road has a surface water license named Springs, uh, Frank Spring on Journey Creek and a deep water well like all the other lots in the Sunset Estate. BC Health has dumped all the liability for all on-site wastewater system in 2005 on the private practitioners. BC Health wants no more liability and is simply a filing system for all the documentation related to all matters of on-site wastewater systems. On Bowen Island, we do have example illustrating this move from BC Health. In Timber, Timber Grove, Scarborough, a septic field pollutes a shallow deep water well. When Abbey Field, now known as Snuck Cove House, drilled a deep water well, the first one was desperately dry and the second one, although very deep, was polluted, probably from Bowen Court septic field. So Abbey Field had to be connected to the Cove Bay water system at an expensive cost. Since BC Health no longer accepts liability for any disposal on on-site system, it would be unwise for the municipality to, to take an, on that liability until all the proper documentation signed and stamped has been received. Those are for three kinds, on-site disposal system. One human, also known as black water, one for all the liquid industrial waste, and last but not least, for the solid industrial waste. This documentation has to cover toilets for the employees of the manufacturing of cider, the public at the retail and sampling location, and also separate toilets for the picnic area. On-site wastewater system has to be installed for the wastewater produced by the manufacturer. And, and we just, uh, we're gonna have to wrap this up. We, now turning to the, okay, turning to the commercial aspect of cidery, let us visualize 20,000 liters of, uh, of cider, that's 40,000 half bottle liters, divided by 52 gives us 760 bottles weekly, year in, year out. How many of you living in a residential area would put up with 600 and, uh, 760 empty bottles one day or another? Last point, this deals with timing of the publicity campaign. During the February 22 meeting, Rob Purdy admitted that he did not take the time to walk all the long driveways of the neighborhood and, and it was computed by COVID. Yet Rob Purdy and Christine Hardy did find ample time to enter the story of the cidery on Facebook. Yes, they have a liquor board license, but do they have Bowen Island Municipality business license for all the businesses mentioned on Facebook, such as tasting room, retailer, short-term rentals. Your worship and counselors, such a seductive and popular application may be tempting for council to issue this temporary use permit top 2021-0017 for cidery at 620 Laurel, but certainly not at the expense of the well-being of the neighborhood that you ought to protect. I hereby vigorously oppose the approval of top 2021-0017 and any potential rezoning of 620 Laurel Road from rural, rural, rural residential to, to rural commercial in our west side Laurel Road neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anne. And uh, next, Hope, please. Margaret Underhill. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. I'm Margaret Underhill. My husband and I have lived at 1405 West Side Road for almost 30 years. 
Our group of neighbors has been blindsided by this tough application. Rob Hart Purdy and Christine Hardy have been living here for almost two years, and we have evidence that they've been planning their business for almost that long. Yet we only learned of their plans by way of the top just prior to the February 22nd meeting or by receiving public notices on March 4th and 5th. Since then, we have asked many questions but received few answers. How can the TUP process not require the applicant to address water quality and supply, traffic volume, and wastewater management issues in advance when the intent is to operate a commercial manufacturing facility? How could a winery manufacturer license be issued when the LCRB requires that applications can only be improved if the proper zoning is already in place? How can municipal staff's assessment of a TUP application be considered impartial in the complete absence of neighborhood input as part of the application process. The applicants state that they do not feel the cidery will be a destination attraction, yet the former property owner who admits to an interest in the cidery states that this will be spectacular for Bowen Island's tourism draw as a go-to location for cider lovers. Who are we to believe? Many of us have spent countless hours in workshops and meetings that formulated the official community plan, Bowen's vision for our present and future. The OCP is there to ensure that our mayor and council consider and respect the collective will and rights of all Bowen Islanders when responding to individual expectations. A cidery may well be a good idea, but this commercial manufacturing operation just doesn't belong in this or in any other quiet rural residential neighborhood. Careful consideration of an appropriate location is needed so that in the words of policy 235, the use will not create an unacceptable negative impact on the neighborhood. As neighbors of 620 Laura Road, we have rights to clean, safe drinking water, to not worry if wastewater is polluting our properties, to continue quiet enjoyment of our rural lives, and most importantly, to expect that our local government will do due diligence to protect these rights for everyone. We continue, continue to pursue answers to our questions and concerns, but the process of obtaining information from government is time consuming. Answers will not come quickly enough to meet the Muni's rushed timeline. Nevertheless, we continue and we are exploring all of our options. We urge Council to do the right thing tonight and reject TUP 2021-0017. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Margaret. Uh, Bob Turner. Hello, Bob, go ahead. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I'd like to speak to the proposed temporary use permit for the cidery on Laura Road. Um, and I'd like to start by saying that I know people on both sides of this issue, and I know that they're all good people, and it pains me to see the acrimony that has developed in this neighborhood. I visited the cidery today, and what I see is a small cottage scale cidery that could be a great asset to Bowen Island. Um, and I think Rob and Christine have taken on a very valuable custodial role for John Riley's Heritage Orchard, which is truly um, a biodiversity treasure of, of provincial importance. It's also clear to me that there's great appreciation for the role that their horticulturalist neighbor, Andre Shalott, has played in assisting the creation of the orchard over many years. It's my view, and I'm an outsider, but it's my view that the cause for friction over this proposed cidery is the apparent mismatch between how the cidery intends to operate, which is, is as a part-time seasonal small-scale family-run operation, and what the temporary use permit allows as currently written. From my point of view, the temporary use permit needs to be amended. When I first read the TUP, my reaction was that what was being proposed was a special event center, a business that's open 365 days a year from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m., now amended to 10 p.m., with provision for special events and an acknowledgement that noise exemptions for late night events might be requested. I mean, it's easy for me to see how this would alarm some neighbors. I'd personally be alarmed. Uh, with traffic issues, potential parking issues, with potential late night noise issues. But as far as I can tell, this is not what Rob and Christine want to do. It's also very, very clear this is not what some neighbors want. So it's my suggestion to council that they amend the TUP 
so that it only enables what is truly needed for the cidery to be a successful small business. I think the neighborhood deserves a TUP that gets it right. And everyone on both sides of the issue will benefit from that. If it takes the deferral for a week or two to get it right, it's worth it. The harmony of this neighborhood is clearly at stake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Oh. Uh, Rosemary Knight. Okay, Rosemary, welcome. Oh, I, I hate it when we end up one after the other. We should plan this a bit better. Okay, good evening, Mayor and <laughs> Councillors. Agenda item 6.1, the TUP for Laura Road. Uh, getting to the bottom line first, I have to say it's very similar to Bob's. Of the various staff recommendations before council, I would urge council to reconsider, or I would urge council to consider option three, that is refer the TUP back to staff for further questions and defer consideration. So what is it in this TUP that causes many of us to say that this three-year TUP is unacceptable? If we were talking about just a small tweak in zoning, just adding the term cidery to the LUB, sure. But the concern is all the additional activities listed. The hours given in this application, 9 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week, this clearly makes the requested use of this property completely incompatible with the quiet neighborhood and the current zoning. There should be a short term, maybe one year TUP in place, bridging to the full rezoning process with clear and specific limits on activities during the TUP period. There's one serious flaw in this process to date, Planning staff have told me that they consistently issue three-year TUPs because this conforms with the Local Government Act, but it's actually inconsistent with our official community plan that requires us to do so much better than that. Each case needs to be individually assessed. To automatically allow three years for something not compliant with current zoning with less than a month for neighbors to respond is wrong. I add that in a discussion I had with the applicant, Rob, yesterday, he had no idea that a TUP could be issued for less than three years. So here's a serious problem with the process. Another serious flaw in this TUP process, there is no required consultation with neighbors prior to application to sort out all the conflicts and issues that can arise. I note that if this was a TUP in a strata, it says on the BIM website, a strata resolution would be required prior to submitting the application. Outside of strata, there is no required consultation prior to submission. So as the applicant has stated, there was no communication with the neighbors prior to this application coming to council, a source of many of the problems. So I don't like being opposed to good people with good ideas and I have talked to the applicant, but I care deeply about and err on the side of supporting those who are living in a neighborhood with reasonable and justified expectations about the activities that will be allowed there. The quick fix of a TUP that allows all these listed activities and for three years is inappropriate here and sets a terrible precedent for this island. So again, I urge council to consider option three, send this back to staff. What's being proposed here it needs a rezoning process. We need a truly temporary bridge to rezoning not a three-year TUP, and we need a TUP that sets much clearer limits in terms of activities. And from my conversations with the applicant, such a TUP would actually more closely match what they want. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rosemary. Next is Susan Alexander. Susan Alexander, welcome. Hey there, everyone. So good to Hi. see you. Evening, Mayor, Councillor, staff, community members. I too am speaking against the TUP at Laura Road, at least as it currently stands. I believe that everyone involved wants the best thing for Bowen Island, but unfortunately there's been a big surprise where, where there could have been process. And what we do in this small TUP and upcoming rezonings is important. The question is, do we want spot zoning, changes to properties in residential areas that allow retail and small industry? And maybe we do, but how is the best way to go about that? Um, 
and there's the agriculture question. Should a cidery be seen as a farm or more like a winery? And I really appreciated our planner, Daniel Martin's engagement with the OCP around ag agriculture in his report. But I can't see that these ideas are best dealt with in a TUP. And I've got no doubt that these questions can all be answered in a satisfactory way for all concerned. And my, my suggestion is backing up and rethinking the TUP um, because ultimately it sent, sets a rezoning precedent that we all need to kind of collectively think through in a long-term way. And in my mind, the bigger question is how are we to set up and how are we to manage sustainable growth on our island long-term? And do we have a fair process that engages and informs and avoids surprises? So it all comes down to effective governance, I believe. And the wonderful thing is we do have a collective vision document to guide the Muni, which is the OCP. And just thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Richard Helm. Good evening, Mary Council. My name is Richard Helm. Hello, Richard. Speaking about the TUP proposal for a cidery on Laura Road. Bowen's community plan states that residential, that residential needs take priority over business needs in residential zone property. The residents we're talking about are the vast majority as, uh, are in the vast majority as voters, landowners, source of taxation on Bowen, and all residents in such zoning deserve assurance of a good neighbor experience, which a TUP should not be able to negate. Most municipalities have the assurance of protection through zoning and bylaws, which residential TUPs are seeking relief from. The neighborhood lobbying and almost pitchfork approach to influencing council's decision on TUPs and the distress that we've witnessed in Deep Bay and now Lower Road is very tough on our community, our councillors, and not good governance. I propose the following solution. Council creates a good neighbor policy to establish a threshold of protection from nuisances by neighbors that all residents can rely on, whether the neighbor is operating under a TUP or not. This policy would have priority so that neighbors need not be fearful of outcomes, knowing that the standards would trump a TUP. These standards would be community derived. My guess is that we are more similar than we think when we consider what impacts we would accept on our own backyards. And so a good consensus could be arrived at. And this method is much different to asking if we believe a TUP should be permitted in someone else's backyard, which is what is happening currently. We have some related bylaws, but they are scattered and incomplete and need to be consolidated. The good news for this, of this for applicants is it would provide them with a level playing field some clear requirements to plan their business model around and reduce the fear-based opposition. Still lots of opportunity for entrepreneurs and cideries, which I support at an appropriate scale. The good news for residents is that they will have the comfort and security of clear boundaries, which neighbors cannot breach. And the good news for council is that the proposals would be streamlined. Councillors would have a clear set of measures with, it, with which to make defensible and consistent decisions. For this particular application, it would mean putting things on pause until the good neighbor policy has been established. And for what it's worth, I'd be happy to work on that committee if council were to strike one. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Richard. Cool. And last is Rob Purdy and Christine Hardy. Okay. Hello, Rob, Christine. Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. Thanks for your time. Uh, we'll take less than two minutes. Um, so TUP, that's a new word for me as of about three months ago, and I know all about it now. Uh, all we want to say is thanks for everybody that was participating in the process. It's been a month of an incredible amount of feedback. I think there's uh, close to a couple hundred letters that went into council, and there's Facebook discussions that are 200 comments long. So uh, we've gotten lots of feedback. It's been great feedback. We've met a lot of people through the process. Everybody that's come to see us, uh, we appreciate you coming by and taking the time. Uh, those that chose not to visit, um, I, I, I would like, it would be nice if you, if you did come by because the understanding 
I think of what we're doing uh, and some of the comments and we've read all the letters multiple times is quite different from what we're actually doing. A, a really good example, our opening hours for the summer, uh, if we're uh, able to do this, will be uh, Thursday to Sunday, noon to 4 p.m. Um, so that's uh, very different from uh, what's been commented on. So that's the scale of what we're doing right now. There's no washrooms at our facility. Uh, there's reference to black water and wastewater. Uh, there's no washroom. So it's designed to basically come pick up something and, and leave. Uh, you can hang around for a little bit if you want. So, um, so there is a misunderstanding, I think, amongst some and in the comments. Um, but other than that, I think it's been, uh, it's been an interesting process. We've engaged a lot of people and we uh, appreciate everybody taking an interest in uh, our, our little project. So uh, that's, I think, all. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much, Rob. All right. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. That's great. And just got to get back here. So we will move uh, into the consent agenda. Does anybody have anything they want to pull out of that consent agenda? I do, Mr. Okay. I'll get to get my get my hand up here. Um, hold on. Okay, so I got uh, Rob first. Yeah, Gary, three point two, please. Okay, three point two. All right, thank you. And uh, okay, that's you, Rob. Uh, Sue Ellen. Three point four, please. Okay. And uh, Mr. Mayor, would you like digital hands or hands up on the screen? Uh, digital is better because I'm working on my small screen here. And it's, okay, uh, thank you. Good to know. Okay. Okay, anybody else have any uh, issues there? Okay, so I've got uh, Al. Why have I got Alan Morse? You're, you're muted, Councillor Morse. I just realized I had to rename myself. Um, oh. The agenda item to do with, with tourism bonds. Um, darn it. I think that's in the consent agenda. Now I can't find it. Uh, there are one, two. There's two. Oh, 3.4. I already pulled it. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll put this in that one too. All right, is that it? Yeah. Forever hold your peace. All right. And so that the council approved the items as outlined in the March 22nd, 2021 consent agenda as amended. I'll move that second. Please. Second. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Michael. And all in favor, aye. 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 <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Um, so we'll move down and we will um, go to section four, which is the items removed from the consent agenda. So we'll start at 3.2 with you, Rob. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Yeah, just a comment maybe from Raj on what the crux of the changes is in this uh, bylaw change, uh, specifically around the uh, sale of community lands and how this could impact paying back the debt to Metro for those lands. Rob, there's actually no change from the original bylaw. What it happened, the intention is the same as it was when it was first proposed. Uh, we received first three readings, but uh, the CAO had uh, decided to hold off on pulling it until we got closer to the sale transactions being completed. So this is more of a housekeeping item. I thought the bylaw had already been adopted, and so I just lost track of, of the housekeeping of it. So it's coming forward to council for adoption. But just to recap, the bylaw is it's called the Land Opportunity Reserve Fund Bylaw. And so any proceeds from and any proceeds from the sales of lands must be deposited to this um, reserve. It'll be a statutory reserve. And then that own funds from that reserve can only be used by council approval and be used according to the bylaw. They can only be used to acquire land or improvements for municipal purposes or to repay debt arouse, arising from the acquisition of property. And that being said, until funds are required for one of these uses, they can be used for another municipal purpose with council approval. They, they can or can't, you said? They can be. 
uh, okay. with approval. Okay, thanks, Raj. So they're required for use by the conditions of the bylaw. Okay, thanks. All right, do you want to read that, Rob? We'll put it back in. Yeah, so um, the bylaw number 522-2020 cited as Bowen Island Municipal Land Opportunities Reserve Fund bylaw number 522-2020 be reconsidered and finally adopted. I'll move that. Okay, I got Michael. Okay, I got Michael is the second and all in favor, aye. 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 Thank you. I'll move on to 3.4 and I'll go to Sue Ellen first. Oh, thank you. Um, I just had a, a couple of questions. One of them is, I was um, wondering, I just wanted to confirm the years because there's a couple of places where the number 2020 is used. So I'm wondering if we can look at page four of their uh, fee for service request. I just, uh, there's a, I'm not gonna go through the various things that I think might be typos, but on page four, um, at the top, Visitor Center budget, it says um, March 2022 and March 2023, but under it says 20 and 20. Anyway, I'm just confused and I'm wondering if somebody can um, confirm that we're talking about next year and the year after, or are we talking about this fiscal year? Um, because uh, on an earlier page, three it talks about 2020 which can't be right so i'm just wondering if somebody could i see you there jody neither hi. jody or andrea confirm that hi uh, good oh, evening Council. thank you so much um sue ellen thank you very much for the good eyes <laughs> i did make a mistake there so um and I'm sorry for the confusion. The very first sentence is correct. My second sentence in the first paragraph is incorrect. So we, the, the, the ask is for fiscal year 2021, so the current year, and then 2022. Mm -hmm. Sorry, our, our fiscal goes from um, April 1st to uh, one year. To, that's why, so I was using our budget projection there. Um, so sorry for any confusion. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to be clear on what we were voting on. Um, so we're talking about uh, this year and then looking at page four again. Um, so this year, your ask is for, um, I'm looking at the second sentence in your very first paragraph there, 32,000 for 2021? Yes. Yes, our not, fiscal 2021, their yes. fiscal 2021 to 2022. Because yeah. we're on a 12 month period. Not, uh, it's okay, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I, yeah. I get it. And uh, I'm just confirming this. And so um, uh, we've just passed a budget. And uh, so I'm wondering oh. how this fits um, with the budget that we've passed. So our budget that we passed has a $20,000 provision for tourism Bowen for 2021. For 2021. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. So it's got 20,000 and they're asking for 32,000? Yes. I believe so. Um, also, so just to clarify also, we actually uh, init initially sent the dialogue or, or hoping to start a dialogue back in November, November 25th. Mm -hmm. And we didn't actually have a chance to dialogue with Hope until um, February. So a little bit, uh, a little bit of uh, delay there. And I understand that by then the budget had been passed. So our opportunity had been missed. But um, also on our part, a little bit of uncertainty on, on the total process of how things go. So um, okay, I'm, ju I'm just trying to be be clear here and, uh, uh, and make sure that I understand. Um, so thank you. And then um, is this about uh, catching up with minimum wages? Um, a, a good part of it is, yeah, our, our original uh, fee-for-service was set in 2016, 
and the minimum wage back there, if I got my, it was 1045. As of um, June 1st this year, the minimum wage is going to be 1520. So that's almost a, a five dollar an hour difference. Um, and our, our, our service agreement hasn't been updated. We, we have tried, we applied for a core funding. We have made numerous appeals um, and, and we just want to really dialogue and come up with a, a fair service agreement that not only the minimum wage, but also recognizes that digital uh, visitor services go 365 days a year. I get emails all the time. People look at our website. That costs money updating the website. Um, yeah, so it's a combination okay. of both <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I get it. <clears throat> Thank you. I was—I thought that's what I was reading, and uh, and I I um I get it about the minimum wage, and I'm seeing a message from Hope. I can't read that right now. Okay, and I'm um, um, hearing you about uh, the minimum wage, and and I agree with you about the digital services. And I realize that we're in a COVID situation, and I'm not proposing any changes. I just wanted to understand what we were voting on today. And um, so I appreciate your um, being available to answer the questions. And, um, uh, and I know <clears throat> I didn't see in here any um, recognition of the, uh, uh, the building that we as the municipality provide and uh, already and the, the space in there that you, you know, it's great that you're sharing it. And, um, <clears throat> but also the, the services and the hydro bills and things like that. Um, uh, or maybe you, t you pay that. I see it says insurance and, in, or sorry, it says utilities in there. Um, but anyway, thank you. So can All I right, thanks, thanks to Alan and yeah. Um, and Allison, what did you, what was your well, issue? Well, I pulled it because I wanted to know what was in the budget provision for, that we've just passed the budget. Um, and I'd also like to know which, which budget category does it come out of? So what we're, we've, we've made a shift. We do, it, it, it is ta a tax funded contribution, but we'll be considering that with the grant, with the multi-year grant issues, because it, it fits in more appropriate in, in that particular area of the budget. So if I'm I was just checking with Hope, I can't remember, but I believe we do have a two-year multi-agreement with Tourism Bowen right now, which was signed last year. For and I think Hope has just confirmed for me that we do have a two-year multi-agreement. It's just a one year, so we need to oh. renew the fee for service for. Oh, we need to uh, renew. Okay, my apologies on that. Okay, so there. So at this point, we you've included in your core grant line in the budget, 20,000 for tourism. Yes. But, and core grants don't usually have a budget of any more than you put in there, but there is the other That's budget category where people ask for grants and aid and um, all the That's other true. grant applications that sort of, yeah, get done That's, every year. That's correct, Councillor Morse. So there is some room for some discussion, maybe. Well, it would take away from the other small, exactly from the other organizations if council were to. Yeah, but at this point, we don't know what they're gonna ask for. Yeah. Yeah. You're correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Allison, do you wanna read that recommendation then? Councillor Nicholson has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Maureen, go ahead. Thank you. And I was similarly confused around the, the date in the in the letter, so it's good to have those um, uh, clarified. Uh, my questions are for staff. Um, so, uh, Raj, yes. can, I just, can I just confirm that I understood what you um, were explaining there? It's a two-part recommendation, and the first part is asking for an additional 12 k per year, and you're saying that even though we have passed our budget, that we could potentially cover that 12K, depending on other submissions from other groups within the community. 
Did I understand that correctly? <clears throat> that is exactly what I was saying. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, it's been, the funding provided to Tourism Bowen has been 15K up until last year. Last year, we increased it five, but I hadn't put a budget provision. I found the 5,000 in our budget. And then in 2021, I've increased the provision to provide them with $20,000 because I that was what I uh, believe the ongoing ask would be when we were in the budget process. So now the only area in the budget that I see funding coming from at present is as we mentioned, the small grants that are awarded through the small community grants program. Essentially, whatever is, yeah. if council were to approve something, we would be reducing the amount that's awarded to, that's available for other smaller organizations. Just off the top of my head, I believe there's about $44,000 available uh, to provide to other organizations. Thank you. In, in that case, I think that the wording of the recommendation is actually excellent because the first part of the recommendation does not say that we would provide an increase in funding to Tourism Tur Tur Bowen Island. It says that we are receiving a letter regarding our request. So we have done so and we can consider at a later time, depending on the um, applications to the uh, grants program, we can consider whether that 12K is, um, is feasible. It's unfortunate that this didn't come forward um, on time to be considered as part of the, um, the, the budget discussions, but I totally understand jo Jody's point that perhaps things got a bit, um, a bit delayed. I also don't have any problem with the second part of the recommendation that says direct staff to include the increased fee for service for consideration in the 2022 budget process. So in passing the recommendations that we have before us, I think we indicate good faith that we are interested in supporting tourism in Island, but at this point we are not committing to any funding increase. The other point that I would mention, right. maybe not so much for council, but for um, uh, members of the public is item 3.5 in the agenda package. Um, is a letter of support for a grant application that Tourism Bowen Island is making to Island Coastal um, Economic Trust. My understanding is that the um, approximate amount of the grant application, and this is from talking with Jody, the approximate amount would be in the neighborhood of $35,000, $40,000. If that funding were to come through, and I think that those um, ice tea grants are on a fast track, that would be a very significant boost to tourism Bowen Island and would cover um, what they, they need in this year and more. So between the two sets of recommendations, the letter and the, the, the formal recommendation, I think, um, I think that's probably as far as I'm prepared to go uh, as, a, as a counselor at this time. It doesn't give tourism Bowen Island the security of that additional $12,000, but um, uh, I, I would not be prepared to support at this point the actual expenditure of an additional 12K. That's all. Okay, thanks, Maureen. Um, uh, do you want to, that recommendation, do you want to change it up or? No, she's good with it. No, I, I want the recommendation to be moved as written. I okay, think good. It's a good recommendation. All right, so I was about to move it. Yeah. The council received a letter from Tourism Bowen Island dated February 3, 2021, regarding request for an increased fee for service for 2021 and future years, and the council directs staff to include the increased fee for service amount for consideration in the 2022 budget process. All right. Thanks, Allison. I got Michael on the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we're May, so, Mr. Mayor, we're voting with hands on screen, but we put up our digital hands to speak. Is that how it works? Yeah, that's yeah, okay. that's sort of what we've been doing, if that's okay with it. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I have other right. different meetings I just wanted to check. Thank you. Okay, sorry, that's it. I, I don't know how they do it in other meetings, but um, that seems to work here as long as Hope can uh, can verify it because I haven't got a full, full screen going on yeah. here. Thank well, you. As long as it works for you, that's great. Okay. May I ask so, one follow-up question of Raj before we leave this topic? Yeah, go ahead. Allison. The grant application deadline is 
Uh, I'd have to look on our website, but I believe it's coming up in the, uh, towards the end of April, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember off the top of my head, Allison. I can, well. All right. So Tourism Bowen needs to submit a grant application for $5,000 yeah. if they're, uh, or yeah. for twenty five, which is. I'll get back to Jody on the, on the deadline okay. and you. point it to their webpage. Okay. Great. Thank you, Raj. Thanks. And Allison. And uh, we're going to move on to delegations. Ann Silverman, Andrea Baston, and David McCollum, Bowen Children's Center, Bowen Children's Center After School Club, purpose built mod on SD45 school property. Over to you, Ann. That's really good news. And we can't hear you, unfortunately. No. Try muting and unmuting again. No. Sorry, no. Have you got the sound turned off on your laptop? Off on the function keys at the top? If you go down to the little arrow beside the mute button, and you click on that, at the bottom one is audio settings. That's a good one to check and make sure that your output level is, and your input level is are kind of in the middle of those sliders. Also, if you have headphones plugged in, and you should unplug them, that would. Maybe try leaving the meeting and coming back. That sometimes work. Our director of engineering has the same problem and that tends to work. I see David McCollum glimmering there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is what everyone You're firewood all day today, David? Pardon me? Were you cutting firewood all day today? Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, Bowen bragging background more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, How many cords? Which that doesn't look like that anymore. It's down on the yeah. ground. <laughs> mm. It's just so you can't see the mess that is my office. <laughs> oh, so it's a virtual wood pile. Oh, totally, yeah. But it, it, oh, is, okay. my, it is my wood pile, though. Uh, nice. Yeah. Well, that's okay, cool. Right? Ann. Give Anne another minute to join here. Can David do some introductions or introductory comments or anything? Or? Let's, 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 I, I think Andrea is vastly more qualified than I am. I'm I'm more moral support than anything else. Well, wow, that sounds great, Andrea. Andrea. All right. Well, Anne is our fearless leader, as you all know, and she has been working, I think, since probably 2012 to create a purpose built space uh, on Bowen Island for the after school club. This is a program of the Children's Center. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the slides or my notes. You guys are catching me off guard. So I'll try. Do you want to me to put the slides up, Andrea? Would that I be useful? I'd love to save that for Anne, actually. So just okay. forgive me if I stumble and if I, if I, um, she has to correct me, that's normal, par for the course. Um, anyway, we've been working, uh, Anne has been diligently working on, on trying to have a designated space for this program of the Bowen Children's Center. This is one of the most used programs that the Bowen Children's Center offers. Um, there are years that we have anywhere between 80 to 100 families where we care for the, their children between the hours of um, primary school ending to when parents can get home on the ferry or when parents are completed at work. Um, different kids every day and we have been successfully renting space at the Bowen Island Community School uh, for years but we have really outgrown the space. Furthermore, after school clubs actually offer programming, care and education, and we can bring in supports that um, the Bowen Children's Center are known for, for kids care supports. And we can't really do that within the school. These, you know, when we build programs, you have to pack everything up at the end of the night because of course, our much needed play care shares one room and uh, teachers are in the next morning at classrooms. The other thing that has impacted us at BICS is teachers will often have to stay after school in their classrooms to do work, to do their prep work. And so the kids are kind of hovering outside in January under covered areas and we're shuttling kids around. So BICS has been amazing. They've been a great partner so far. Um, we just grow into a size where we're looking at, we need some space. So uh, we've been talking to the municipality, I believe for years, the after school club, um, 
wait till Lonnie, I think Anna's calling. And Andrea, <laughs> Anna's back as well, and I think we can hear her. Let her take over. Yeah. Now would be a good time for the slides. <laughs> And are you there? I'll just finish Andrea's sentence. We've been working on this project since 2012. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. I'm glad you Perfect. can hear Thanks. me and sorry for the trouble. No worries. Um, we, we have a little slide show for you. If hope if you could pull that up. That would be great. And while we're waiting for that, our our oops. Are you wrong? She started. Thank you for sharing. Sorry, just wrong. That was the wrong, wrong one. Let's try that again. Thanks, Andrea. Sorry, Anne. Just give me one sec. I don't know where it went. Wait, sorry. Andrea, I don't normally email do the slide. So, pardon me. I said, quick, Andrea or David, mail, email it to Hope. Yeah, Hope, well, do you want me to resend it to you right now? It's a Google Doc, so I shared with you the Google Slides, so it's not gonna be an attachment. Got it, I got it here, just sorry about that. Bear with me. Where did you all go? Here we go. Okay. Thank you. So um, this is our second slide, a little history just that we have started, been working on an after school club designated space since 2012. And at this point, as we're moving a little bit away um, from doing it on the community lands, I'd really like to thank uh, both um, Councillor Maureen Nicholson and Mayor Gary Ander for all the time and energy over the past several years that you put into um, dealing with our issues and problems and uh, and concerns and 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 wants. So thank you both for that. Um, what is the after school clubs? For those of you, I'll just be brief, who don't know, it's licensed after school care for any student living on Bowen Island. So that is not necessarily children who uh, go to Bix, but also children who use IBLC or who for ever, whatever reason are schooled at home. We do occasionally have children who use it, especially during COVID, as a social uh, program, um, even if they're not in school. So uh, we, we offer service for gradual entry for uh, <coughs> kindergarten. Kindergarten um, starts very gradually in September, and so families have to cover um, their, the care, otherwise they can't work. Often that's for uh, three or four days at the beginning of the month and then gradually for the two weeks of gradual entry. Um, we also ensure that we try and give families and the recreation teams support and surround care for doing recreation programs in the afternoon and they might come to us um, first and have a snack and then we would make sure they have their sports equipment or whatever it is and go off to their program and then they come back to us after until the parents pick up at six or so. Um, we provide supported child care for children in needs of extra support. So sometimes you have children who have specific um, learning issues or challenges and uh, they need somebody who's, um, who's there for them the whole time. So we work with an organization on the North Shore called Supported Child Care and they would provide both um, programming and um, support for the child as well as money to us to fund a position uh, so that we can support them. And we also, this is an excellent opportunity for adults who are 19 and above to, um, to work part-time. The after-school club usually runs from 2.30 until 6. And, um, and we work very closely, of course, with Bix. Next slide, thanks, Hope. Sorry, Anne, is this the slide you'd like? Yes, thank you. So as Andrea was uh, speaking about just as I came back in, why a dedicated space? Well, if you, it, offering uh, programming for 60, up to 60 families. So we have 40, 42 children a day 
in a space that doesn't belong to you is pretty difficult. We have one cupboard to hold materials and everything else has to be brought in every day. We have graduated from using the CUR, the community use room at VIX, as well as the multi-purpose room, which is not available during COVID and the library not available during COVID and the gym available some days, um, even more so than when we didn't have COVID. But offering that kind of care and programming um, really is tough without having a classroom that you can count on, that you know where things are, that's set up, et cetera, et cetera. We would also like, um, so we serve between 16 and 20 children a day in two different places. Snacks are prepared in the kitchen and they have to be delivered to the two places. So it's, it's, it's a juggle, it's, it really is. Um, we would also like and have been trying to offer for a number of years before school care because you have parents who families who need to catch ferries and so they need care before um, before school starts. And so we would like to offer a breakfast club um, from six to eight thirty in the morning and we would like to offer and we do offer um, care for children from kindergarten through grade four between when school ends at 2.30 until, uh, until six. Um, we also offer care on when uh, BIX has days where they have different things going on and they have early dismissal uh, between 12 and two. So on those days, we offer care for that time for children so that families don't have to pick them up and bring them to after school care at 2.30. We also offer professional development days and some summer child care. Um, we will be really delighted to have both our classrooms be in the same spot. So uh, that would mean instead of having two different spaces to have to coordinate, um, we're thinking of the mod to have the kitchen in the middle so that um, there is separation of ages, but there is uh, joint use of the community facilities. Can you go to the next slide, Hope? So oh, this is just letting you know that um, the after school club um, is, is supported by the OCP, um, eight number two community facilities, objective 153 and objective 155. Um, and the Bowen Island Child Care Plan, which is on the BIM's website. Um, we had goals when we did the plan and the short term goal, the first goal was to open a before school care program for families needing that before school started. And in the medium term goals, the goal, the second goal was to build an after school club space um, to expand the program and offer more child care to more Bowen families with school age children. So. Um, as you can see, it's well supported by the OCP and the child care plan. Thanks, Hope. So what are we looking at? So we've been looking at two choices. One was um, for the, oh, I don't know, past, I guess, before this one, the community plan for the uh, community center. We were involved in that. And um, with our discussions with um, with um, Mayor Ander and um, some other um, employees at BIMS, we decided that we would pursue us uh, um, to we would pursue SD45 to see if they were interested in having us. Um, on the school grounds themselves. We've looked at so many options over the years with different places and spaces, but really um, after school care and before school care has to be at the school. So um, to our delight and surprise, SD45 welcomed us with open arms. They have a after before and after school care at every school in their West Van district. Um, um, they, they need us to be good partners and um, so we're moving ahead with that. We've had um, uh, an initial meeting with um, Britco. We're looking at two people that provide more. Gary's iPad is talking, okay. Um, we have, we have, that's okay. Uh, we have two um, mod, people, the companies that build mods. One is Britco, you've probably all heard of it. And they do work with SD45 and they have a great track record. And the other one we're looking at is Atco, 
which is an award-winning first place 2019 Modular Building Institute with distinction. One of the reasons we're looking at two is because um, usually when you apply for funding with um, the Ministry of Children and Family Development, you need to have two of everything, you know, so that they can see that you've done your due diligence. So next slide. which is our next steps. So uh, we're moving ahead with SB 45. We're going to finalize our agreement with them. Uh, we need to design and finalize the mod plans. We're in the beginning stages of that. We need to apply for our grant. Um, and we, uh, we're we hoping for BIM's collaboration uh, with our permit process. We have already submitted the uh, BIM collaborative project application. Um, and we will be asking for a letter of support. And, um, and we have to secure our necessary building permits. Um, and we also think it's very important to work with our community partners to educate the community about the benefit of the project, um, to, to um, enable our partners. We would like to have a meeting with REC and all the people that work at BIX um, in recreation so that we can um, figure out how to provide their programs with surround care um, as we, we have done for, for a long time. Um, and we're, we're um, the, flexible hours that this will allow for families with school-aged children will really make their lives a lot easier. I think um, most of you know that families have changed from, um, they have, now we have, the reason the population of the after-school club has gone up so much points to the fact that usually the two people, two partners in the family uh, need to work. So it's uh, gone are the days when, when someone, when most families have the, uh, privilege of having one person stay at home. Um, and we hope to hold an open house and ad adopt as transparent a planning pr uh, process as possible. Because um, I, I think that uh, there will be changes because the mod will go up on the BICS grounds and we wanna make sure that everybody is happy with that. Anything to add, Andrea or David? No, not for me. Thanks, Anne. Okay. No, um, nor for me. Any questions? This was really, um, we're not really asking for anything at the moment. We just wanted to apprise you of what we're doing and how we're moving forward as part of our open planning. And um, uh, we're excited. So uh, any questions from anyone? I just... Uh... How about timeline, Anne? Is there what are you thinking at this point? Um, Britco told us when we met that they take two to three months from the time we actually sign on with them. So the grant application, which has not been posted yet and is due to be posted, I understand, in May, um, depending upon when their deadline is. And Maureen, if you have further information, let me know. <laughs> but uh, um, so we plan to make that application deadline. If, uh, if it's announced and we've got a month turnaround, we've, we're already working on the grant application um, just from the past applications that have been posted. Uh, so to get our ducks in line and then we would have to, until we know we've got the grant, we cannot sign a contract with whoever we choose to do the mod. And then it takes, as they said, two or three months for Britco and Atco. I don't know what their, um, what their longer term is for delivery. So we're hoping to move forward with it this year. Good. And, um, and then of course, putting it in will depend upon many different things. It'll be, depend upon big schedule and children and days and that kind of thing. So we will, we will keep you uh, definitely informed and be asking for some support along the way. Perfect. Perfect. We'll do what we can. Um, is the location changed from the one that we originally thought about, which was sort of in the forest there? Yes. Okay. It has. Um, we cannot build in the forest because for two reasons. One is we would have to take down some of those beautiful big cedars and yeah. um, nobody was very happy about that. 
Um, we need a triple wide portable in order to service the families that we have now, never mind moving into the future. So we have come up with two different spots and um, they are both down on the, on the asphalt. Um, but we're, we're waiting for a uh, spring break to be over to um, actually engage with SD45 and with, um, with, with Scott Slater in order to figure out where's the best place for it to, for it to go. Um, and so we'll be back to you when we know exactly where the location is and we can actually map it out. That's terrific. And that's really good news. It's moving along. Yes, it, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a well-needed service. Who have I got on the list here? I got Maureen first and then Rob. And Rob as well. uh, thank you. And uh, I'm really delighted to see this come to council, uh, Anne and Andrea and, and David. Um, when we talked earlier uh, this year, um, we, we talked about what you needed from, from the municipality. And sort of top of the list was the, the letter of support for the, the grant application. And yes. I, my general sense is that council would not have any difficulty in, in providing such a letter of support. One of the points that's brought up in your, um, in, in your uh, documentation here is a potential waiver of, uh, of some of the, the fees involved. And uh, it's not a question for you, but a question for staff. I think it would be helpful for council to know what the cost would be if the various fees that um, uh, Anne has identified in, in, in her correspondence, what the total cost would, would be for us to, to consider. And, and then finally, it's just a, a, a point related to the notion of a partnership with a, a municipality. Um, one of the key points that's made in the grant application and in discussion that I had with the um, ministry staff was that it was uh, applications were viewed more favorably if they were um, being presented as uh, a, a partnership with the municipality. That partnership language has always been a little vague to me. I don't know um, if a letter of support constitute sufficient partnership. So I think that that might be worth further discussion um, with, with the ministry. So those are my three comments. And, and I just want to say how glad I am to, to see this come forward. And I think it could really make a difference in quality of life for a lot of families on this island. So thank you. I agree, Maureen. Thank you. Here, here. Thanks, Maureen. Rob? Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Anne and Andrea. And, uh, as you pointed out in the OCP, you know, the child care is a huge issue. I know I have a three-year-old niece. I should go to the Uncle Amy drop-in program on Saturdays that you run. So really appreciate the work that you're doing and very supportive. And as Maureen just mentioned, very exciting to see this now get on to the next phase. Um, a bit to touch on Gary's comma as well. And I was really happy to hear location that you're really taking into account the forested area there, because it is, I was in the playground there a little while ago and it's super special for kids to be able to run around the school yeah. in the forest. So I'm really happy to hear that you're taking that into consideration. Um, so hats off on that, because I wouldn't want to see a lot of cutting and trees and all that kind of stuff happening. And I take it, I don't think transportation will be much of an issue because I guess most kids, the majority of kids will be at the school. And if there's any drop off for that, I take it that would happen in the existing parking lot at the school. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thanks a lot, Anne, and best of luck. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Sue Ellen? I think all my questions have been answered by the previous and the things I wanted to say. So just good luck, you guys. That's great. Thanks, Sue Ellen. Yeah, that's, that's really good news indeed. It's been a long, uh, it's been a long haul. Uh, I got Allison in there. Allison? Just a thumbs up. Way to go. Good going. Oh, good thumbs luck up there, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't a hand up. Thank it was you, a thumbs Allison. up. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. Good news. And uh, we'll, be, we'll definitely be in touch. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne and Andrea. Great news. Thank uh, you. Thank you, everybody. Of course, David. Good night. The woodshop guy. All right. Take care, you guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 All right. Um,
Going to move right on to business arising from the minutes. 6.1 is a temporary use permit application, TUP 2021-0017 for 620 Laura Road, Rob Purdy and Christine Hardy. And over to you, Daniel. I think you're there somewhere. There you are. Great. Manager of Planning and Development. And we'll let you uh, let you go there. Thank you. Uh, no volume. And had a similar issue, Daniel. If you just leave the meeting and come back in, it sometimes works. Sorry, it's a bit of a hassle. I don't know why that keeps happening. No idea. I really don't know. I think Daniel's the rest of the meeting, so we really can't go ahead without him. Pretty much take the rest of the night off, yeah. And he's on vacation. Oh, Bob was quick. <laughs> Went and got a cup of tea. How's that? There you go. That's better. Thanks. Okay, good. All right. It's all yours. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Oh. Okay, great. Um, so the first item for discussion tonight is the TUP for 620 Laura Road. Um, so this, as we've heard, is located on the west side of Bowen Island at the intersection of West Side Road and Laura Road. Um, this is just the, the overall site plan shown in the application. Um, so the property itself is zoned um, RR2 and this allows a number of uses, including agriculture. Um, and agri agriculture includes the producing harvesting um, of livestock or, or fruit and includes the processing and sale of that product. Um, Okay, in the OCP, this is um, designated an R1, so a rural one land designation. Um, so the, the descriptive text for that designation says it includes large lots that provide rural resource values, such as agriculture and forestry, and properties that have been maintained for purpose of a rural lifestyle. Um, and then further in our OCP has a temporary use permit section and a guiding policy for that. It says that the municipality may consider issuing temporary land use permits provided the use will not create an unacceptable negative impact upon the natural environment or the character of the neighborhood. Um, permits shall be issued in accordance with the Local Government Act and all areas within the one island municipality boundaries are designated temporary use permit areas. Um, so I'm not going to go over the whole detail of the application that I went over um, when we introduced this, but, but just to give you the, the overview. Um, so as of the last update to this presentation, so um, on Friday afternoon, we received 110 letters in result of our notification on this application, um, 72 supporting the proposed temporary use permit and 33 opposed. And then just shown on the map is trying to show um, the properties in green are the properties that we sent the, um, the mail out to. So you see the, the, those within 300 meters. And so of those receiving the mail out, we received seven letters of support and six opposing it. Um, and then of those 110 letters I saw in the on table items, we received another nine letters for supporting and five opposed. So to add those to the title. I apologize. I see counselors squinting at this this map. So I'll just try to That's okay. <laughs> it's just me. No, just I'm squinting me. away too, just trying to figure out how to make it bigger, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so just to show that of, of those who received letters, it, it seems fairly split. Um, so staff are proposing two additional amendments as a result of the feedback that we've received on this application. So one is changing the wording of, of a condition that's already in the TUP to, to make, make it clear that a lounge area endorsement is not permitted. Um, so just changing that word to better match the language from the liquor board of what they would endorse as a, a lounge area endorsement, they call it. Um, and the second is, is the hours of putting in hours of operation. Um, and you saw the letter from the applicant as well, um, suggesting further reductions to that. So to restrict the hours of operation from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Sunday. Um, so the staff recommendation is that council amend the TUP to include those maximum hours of operation and issue the TUP as amended. Okay. So that's it, Daniel? That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, just a few comments first. I appreciate all the 
factors we got and the concerns in the neighborhood. I, there seems to be a misunderstanding in this TUP, and I, I will have a question on that, uh, Daniel. Um, the TUP is exactly what it is. It's a temporary use permit. The proponents say that they will be engaging into a rezoning uh, very, very quickly into that because they don't want to leave it going. They want to see how the operation is going to go, and then they'll start with the, uh, the process of the rezoning. Uh, they, uh, there are, it's not, it's not to circumvent the rezoning is, is what I'm saying. The, uh, there are other operations in that area. I mean, we do have the horse stables at Evergreen. They've got the dog ranch. Uh, it's apparently there's a sawmill in there. So it's not, um, totally devoid of, um, commerce in that area. Um, John and Josephine Riley, the orchard itself is almost like a national treasure. I think they have more types of apples in there than anywhere else in Canada, for sure. It is very unique. I think it's a great fit for Bowen Island. And um, I guess a question for you, um, and I basically the TUP is a chance to see if they can make, if they can make it work and if it, if it fits in the neighborhood, that's the other big part of it. And if we, if we get too much uh, static back from the neighbors about noise or anything, I can't see that possibly happening. This isn't a, a sort of deep bay operation where, um, you know, the houses are all 20 feet apart. These are large, large lots, uh, some in excess of two acres, and it's, it's a very rural environment. And I, I don't see two things. I don't see the concern for the uh, traffic and I also don't see concern because it's not going to be a big operation. Now, having said that, Daniel, can we, can the DUP be canceled for non, uh, for non-conformance? I mean, I've had this question before and I would imagine if there are conditions in the temporary use permit that are laid out and are not being followed. Yeah. Um, that it would be, it would either be canceled or I mean, more simply, I think, would be that the business license would be revoked for a business operating under a temporary use permit that where the conditions aren't being met. Um, so in either of those cases, that, that if, if conditions are put in the permit and aren't being followed, that the municipality, you know, would not be continuing permission for the business to operate. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, okay, well, let's start on the list here, Sue Ellen. Sue Ellen, go ahead. Sure. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, speak in favor of the concept first, and then I'm going to um, uh, propose uh, alternative three. I'm, uh, um, I love that orchard. I've been friends with the uh, Rileys for many years, worked on them on many volunteer projects, well, with Josephine, and uh, I'm familiar with the, pro uh, with the project. Their last plants and people tour, I had the post down uh, at the exit near the beehives. Anyway, I brought with me um, a catalog from another um, mail order uh, heritage tree, rare and heritage tree orchard. Um, this one is from more than 20 years ago. Um, and shortly after I got the catalog, their family circumstances changed. They were on Cortez Island and that orchard blinked out for uh, the public. And so that it was gone. This was uh, intercoast. Anyway, it's just an example. On the back, by the way, I have some of uh, my notes from John Riley about the best apple trees on Bowen, the best varieties for Bowen, because they also treat it as a research site in terms of sustainability. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I can give you the list another time. It's from 2000. <clears throat> I just wanted to mention that because I'm very familiar with the site and the scale of the operation there. I think of it as a gene bank that those a living collection of trees. And as we head into a um, climate that won't be as stable for agriculture, I think it's even more important to have a kind of seed bank, except in this case, you have to cut the scion wood. You have to cut the twigs to add them. That's how you reproduce these uh, special varieties that are really good for the coast or uh, other conditions that may uh, follow. So it's a biodiversity and it's a human sustainability uh, and agriculture 
um, resource I see, um, as well as the research that happened there. There's also the uh, learning about sustainability that could come through this project uh, if people, uh, the public gets more access to the grounds, they get a chance to see the varieties of trees get inspired by the uh, collection and the idea that they could grow food in their backyard or on their property. And, um, and that these trees might be available. Um, I know the, uh, uh, the current owners made a bunch of, uh, made a number of young trees available last fall, which is another uh, resource. Anyway, I won't go on. Great example of rural living. Um, uh, they have employed people over the years, um, including our son for a couple of summers. And mm -hmm. um, so I know the, the current operation well in the buildings and the um, cider mill, I think it's called a mill, I forget what it, press that's already there. And, uh, or I assume it's the same one. So to me, this is like, uh, how do you preserve all those apples? You can only eat so many apple pies. Um, all that fruit, uh, you make it into jams and jellies or cider. And uh, I think these are compatible with rural living on a sustainable island. So um, there's questions about the scale, however, and the difference between the, the uh, liquor, liquor and cannabis board permit and the TUP draft that's in front of us and what I understood um, was available on the site and what we're hearing from the applicant. So that needs to be clarified, I think. There's environmental concerns. Those need to be checked into, I think, uh, if depending on the scale and the uh, kind of activity. Um, I think uh, the neighbors need more time to talk together. I'm reluctant for council to get involved in a uh, neighbor dispute, um, neighborhood. I think there could be lots of common ground if they have a chance to find it. And the uh, element of surprise has, uh, has not helped here. I think um, TUPs in general, these temporary use permits, I think we need to find a better way to use them on Bowen uh, rather than, I mean, I understood from staff that now the best use of uh, this tool, this temporary use permit is changing and maybe it could lead up to um, land use bylaw changes, but uh, that's new for Bowen, and I don't. Uh, I don't think the current um, notice period is long enough for a change uh, that could be that significant in terms of a lead up to a land use bylaw uh, change. And um, uh, and I think we look, need to look at what is it to UP? Is it just seasonal one time things, or are we going to use it differently? I think we might need a no bigger notice period and a bigger notice area as we did this time, not just a hundred meters. And, uh, and I also appreciate that, that it's in COVID. So how could neighborly um, communication happen in a timely manner? Over the fence, on the, on the road, in the garden. <laughs> so I'll stop there and I'll just say, I'm going to propose uh, alternative three. And, uh, and also that we later do something different with our TUP process. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sue Ellen, and move on to David Hawking. Thank you, Gary. And um, I won't talk for very long here because I think we've all um, heard quite a lot. We've all uh, read quite a lot. And um, several of us are, have been to visit the site and or as Sue Ellen said, are, are very familiar with this property. Um, <clears throat> we all, we all um, know that this orchard is incredibly valuable, uh, valuable from a Bowen perspective, valuable from a provincial, maybe even a national perspective. We also, I think, with most of the letters, most of us like the idea of taking the, the produce on bone and processing it with a little business and making some cider. And I think anyone who's met, uh, met, met uh, our, our, our proponents know that uh, uh, the Rob and Christine will do an excellent job of looking after that property and, and, uh, and, and working with the neighbors. Um, the issue has come down as several people have mentioned is misunderstanding around the scale. Um, I went and visited it yesterday and really it's all tiny. There's a, a tiny little patio, there's a tiny little tasting room. Uh, there will be no food served, there will be no washrooms. So nobody's going to be staying very late and making a racket. Um, it's the kind of thing that fits in perfectly to that little neighborhood that I've wandered through, cycled or walked through many, many times. 
Um, so um, I'm, I uh, like the changes that Daniel has, has made about the, um, um, the no lounge. Um, and um, we've got changes to the hours, so to move the hours down so that there's no late night stuff whatsoever, and Daniel's gonna put that into the TUP. I'm just wondering if we look at the TUP, and, and so this is on page two, there's a couple of other things we have there. I'm wondering about just making some small changes. We've got uh, six and seven, the maximum floor area of retail space for the cider use is 50 square meters. And the maximum area of the exterior patio space is 200 square meters. If the issue people worry about is size and traffic um, and noise, I mean, the, the, the proponent um, um, has said they don't need that much space. Maybe we should shrink that down to what they're looking for because after all, they plan to do a rezoning very quickly and it's, they're, you know, they're trying it out right now. So I'm going to suggest that um, we um, take option one, but we make a couple of more small amendments to, uh, the, um, to the TUP that fit the size that the, um, um, uh, that the proponents are, are proposing. And, um, and then we just let that move forward. So those are my comments. Thank you, uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, thank you, David. Those are uh, very worthwhile. Uh, Maureen. Sorry, I'm fumbling here. Um, I am going to vote in support of the TUP with, uh, as amended um, by Daniel. I would be fine. Uh, with uh, what David has suggested as well. So some additional small amendments, if we can agree on them uh, during this meeting. Uh, I also went to visit the, uh, the orchard uh, over the weekend and, and I'm fairly familiar with it from the exterior, but walking through and actually seeing the scale of operation <coughs> that is, uh, is proposed was very helpful in clarifying my thinking around this, as were some of the details um, around uh, such things as, as water usage. So water is apparently not used in the production of cider, which was something I certainly didn't know and, and mm -hmm. perhaps many of the neighbors uh, didn't know. Um, I, I look forward to genuinely using the um, heritage orchard in a, in a productive way that would ensure its, its continuity in the future. And one of the things that you know, hasn't been brought up so far, although it has been brought up in, in other discussion, is that it's, it requires a lot of labor to maintain that property and to make sure that it's, it's going to be that wonderful reservoir of apple varieties for, for the future. And the expenditure involved there is, is significant. So proposing a cidery is a way of maintaining what is a true heritage asset uh, for Bowen Island and, and, and beyond seems to me to be, uh, to be reasonable given the, the scale that's being, that's being proposed. The, the other point that I, I wanna mention, um, this uh, temporary use permit did not go to the, um, uh, community Economic Development Committee. And I, I kind of regret that because I think that we would have gotten feedback from, from the committee. Maybe it's not typical um, procedure for things to go to uh, committees when it's a TUP, but in this case, I think it would have been useful. And one of the things that um, uh, a number of um, respondents have pointed to is the OCP and their concerns about um, uh, alliance alignment between what is proposed here and the um, and and what is in the OCP, and I, I always go to a section of the OCP that I think is perhaps less explored, and it's the implementation section. And when you look at that implementation section, and you think in terms of the economic development of the island, the community economic development of the island, the OCP offers very little. And um, if you'll just put up with me, uh, I'm gonna quickly recap them. The first thing is that the municipality is gonna work with Bowen Island businesses and communities, which, which we do. Um, we will promote economic activity that builds on diversity, sustainability, 
innovation, and creativity. I think this particular proposal ticks all those boxes. The third point is to explore the formation of a business improvement association. So that's what's in our OCP and we've zigzagged around that over the years and it hasn't come together. The fourth point is to promote green business leadership and sustainable business practice. There have been some questions raised about whether what is being proposed here is a viable business and I would argue that the TUP is there precisely to enable the proponents to assess whether it is a viable business. Next point is to work with the Chamber of Commerce to complete an, e an economic development plan. And we don't have a Chamber of Commerce, but we're working on that economic development plan right now. And then the last two items in the OCP, which is supposed to be one of our guiding documents, the last two items are to support the initiative to establish a national park reserve, and then finally, to encourage significant community involvement in the establishment of a national park reserve. Personally, I was all for a national park. It didn't happen. It didn't happen a decade ago. What it says in our OCP about economic development on this island is profoundly lacking in detail and is not useful in thinking about such things as what we have before us. So uh, with that, I'll be voting in support of the temporary use um, permit um, as amended. Okay, thank you, Maureen. That's great. Um, I think Michael is next. Yeah, uh, I, I would like to thank Maureen. You've completely stolen my thunder on the last <laughs> bit of the, <laughs> but okay, it shortened it because you, you nailed it. And um, very firstly, those people who wrote in regarding the, um, the TUP, I have to say, and this is the second time we face this, Melmore Road is very clear in my mind what we went through then. And in some ways, this very term TUP is cursed by its name because lots of sensible people find the word temporary and three years very hard to align. And I think that is understandable. And I'd like to thank some people who made to me, some very sensible remarks about what we might do with TUPs in the future. Thank you for your comments. They have not been abandoned. They have been noted. And I appreciate your, your input. Um, ha having said that, I too went to visit this tiny, small business. And um, I have to, would like to point out that this is one of the most highly regulated types of businesses you can come across. And I am particularly impressed by the opportunity to make some amendments as, as listed here to the uh, TUP, which I will certainly support. Uh, it goes without saying that this orchard is part of, is, is unique. It's probably, I think I'm fair in saying it's unique throughout Canada. It's probably one of the most special orchards in the whole of Canada. And I see this enterprise as being a way to make sure that it is safeguarded, looked after in the, in the future. And I am personally confident that it's in very good hands. When I worked uh, on our Bowen branding committee, we looked, in essence, at what was quintessentially Bowen. What, what kind of defined Bowen Island? Well, to me, this very special enterprise, this remarkable, piece, this remarkable legacy, is one of those businesses that does define us, and it defines us well. I hate a play on words, but I think it's in the right spot, and I think the business is spot on. And I say that to the answer for those people who like to talk about spot zoning. So I support it. Thank you for proposing these changes uh, to the TUP. Let's give these good folks some certainty to ensure that this precious part of our heritage is well looked after, sustained and maintained. And I think it will, you can see from letters came from both sides Huge, a huge amount of support. And even those who found that they weren't able to support it for various reasons, many of them 
complemented the 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 uh, orchard itself and the, necess the necessity to look after this very valuable part of the island which is ours to preserve we only hold it in trust so i wish them well and i hope it's a great success and i hope this special part of bowen goes from strength to strength thank you gary okay thank you michael uh over to allison please oh i'm unmuted um, got to read my notes here and that's going to be difficult. Um, I too am very familiar with the property and have had a tour on it. And the tasting room area is very small and the patio room area is very small. And interestingly, you know, the houses on West Side Road, you can't see their, the houses from West Side Road. And similarly, you can't see the cidery from West Side Road. Maureen said a lot of what I was going to say, our Councilor Nicholson said a lot of what I was going to say about um, the economic policies in the uh, OCP. But one other that wasn't mentioned is policy 417, which I think um, explains the uses of temporary use permits. Home-based businesses, which propose to operate on a, at a site at a level beyond that permitted in the land use bylaw, will require a rezoning or a temporary use permit. And temporary use permits are an ideal way to see if the business will work and if iron the kinks out, put conditions on it so that you can see how it'll work with those on. And the cannabis shop was, is a good example of that. Um, and um, so just, and then as to traffic, I don't think the traffic um, to visit the cidery would cause any more concern than traffic that's going to the trailhead um, to the properties on West Side Road. And then the other comment is, the branding exercise that Michael mentioned, the interviews with all the people when they were, that was being done and uh, they, people moved to Bowen, commuted a lot and then said, I've got to find something to do on Bowen so that I don't have to commute. And this is an ideal example of that. We've got a home-based business that's going to be run at a small scale Thursday to Saturdays or Thursdays to Sundays, can't remember which, from 12 to four. There's a family there. So with young children, they're not going to want to have rowdy parties and all that stuff. So it's a small family home-based business, which is the kind of thing we're trying to encourage on the island. Um, quite happy with the changes that are being suggested. And um, I, I think we should uh, go ahead and issue the temporary use permit. Okay, thank you, Allison. Rob? <coughs> Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, yeah, I won't cover a lot of the territories that some councillors have mentioned. Uh, I, I've been to the property a couple of years ago. I actually have one or two tree cutoffs growing in our little apple orchard. So really appreciate sort of some of Councillor Fast's comment about the benefits of propagating local apple trees across the island. Um, the TUP, I, uh, you know, and Councillor Morris touched a bit on this. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity for us to see how this is going to work. I think a lot, one of the frustrations I had in, in, with the IDLC and the Deep Bay there is that I think a lot of the concerns would have never come to fruition if we had seen that school operating there. Uh, but if we go for a full rezoning right off the bat, we're basically, we don't have any controls over that anymore. So I like the idea of trying it out, seeing how it works. I do have concerns around transportation. So I wanna see how the proponents deal with that and making sure that there aren't lots of cars coming there. Um, sending it all the way back to staff for a rewrite and a redo. I, I don't, I think that's a big barrier to trying this out and giving the, uh, giving the proponents an opportunity to try out this business. Um, I do like some of Councillor Hawkins' comments around uh, if this is not going to be a big outdoor seating area with like Persephone or something like that, which obviously it won't be to that scale. But if we can, I don't know, Daniel, if on the fly we can tighten up on that, if you think that that is something that's viable to do, uh, <clears throat> it would make me feel more comfortable voting on this right off the bat tonight. So I don't know, Daniel, if you can comment on that. Uh, the other comment, Daniel, for, uh, I'd like from you is, are we setting any precedents here moving forward with property or is this very much tied just to this property and we're not setting a major precedent moving forward with some of these changes? Okay, 
So taking that second question first, I mean, I don't think it's a, a precedence any more than other temporary use permits we've issued. It's still for council to evaluate on a site specific basis. Um, and I think You're cutting in and out there, Daniel. You might need to turn off your video. Sorry, Daniel, we've lost. I don't know if that's just me. Rose, there he is. There you are. You're back there. Good. All right. How much did you hear? Nothing. <laughs> okay. You started it's with the second part first. On my end. Um, uh, <laughs> all I said was that any like any temporary use permit, I guess, gives gives a sort of a signal for people of what council is interested in, but doesn't set a precedent beyond, you know, what what you what you want it to take. Like, council would still evaluate each application on its own merits. Um, and I think for this example and other ones that council's passed, it's you know I tell all applicants council's listening heavily to um, views of the neighbors and and on what's proposed and how it fits into the neighborhood. And I think that would still be true. Um, in terms of David's proposed motions. I put some wording into my slide and I passed it on to Hope in terms of, so I think it's, yeah, definitely council can amend the temporary use permit to reduce the size of the retail area and the picnic area um, to, to basically match what's there existing. I think I put in slightly higher numbers than I put in the council report just to make sure that it's not, you know, that it's not slightly bigger than, than what's there, but that would essentially restrict it to what, what is there on site. Hey, thanks, Daniel. Rob? Yeah, that's good. Hope, do you have any wording along that that you can pass on to us? Can I just ask a question on that wording? Is it possible to say the maximum, the floor area of the retail space of the cidery is to be no bigger than the existing building? Yeah, I mean, the, the existing retail is only a portion of the existing building. It's about a third of the building is retail. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. right, right. That That's, forgot about that part, yeah. So let's, um, I, I think there seems to be a common thread here to two of the things, obviously, Daniel, your two amendments to the, uh, the recommendation. Now, as far as the, uh, the conditions of size of the retail, size of the retail, and I, I don't know who was up there, but I guess that, that is 15 square meters. And I'm thinking, well, what if we double that to go to 30? and the maximum area of the, exter uh, the exterior patio space, 200 meters seems a little on the high side. I thought if we went to 120, but those are just some thoughts. Um, if they're going to apply for a rezoning, there will be new figures in the rezoning. So I'm thinking for the actual TUP itself, that would probably be adequate. And I don't know how everybody feels about that. I'd like to speak to that. I agree with the numbers you put out, Gary. I, you know, I was originally just looking at the numbers that Daniel had in his report, where he had, and I don't have it in front of me, the 200 meters, where it's yeah. able to use such and such. I'm a little nervous about having going down to the exact size they currently have. Like, what if they put one more, need one more seat over here, or something like that? So I like the numbers that you have. They're still small and yeah. uh, a little bit larger than what we have right now, but they, it, it it maintains that small size, and I think that's. The objective. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. Uh, any comments, Daniel? I guess the applicant isn't on the line, is he? So we could ask what the actual sizes of those spaces are. Well, we got it here. That's what the actual spaces are now. Yeah. What? Sixty square meters for the patio oh. and oh, fifteen okay. for the for where, the Where where have center. you got that? It's in Daniel's under report. proposed conditions. Was that in his report? What page are you on, Gary? I don't know. I'll, I'll tell everybody. It's, it's The conditions are in, on page two of the team. Page two, yeah. But if you look, go back up to Daniel's report, and I'm not scrolling back up, uh, where he talks about, there we go, it's on page two of Daniel's report. Ah, uh, gotcha. Down, it says maximum size of retail space, 50 square meters, in brackets, yeah. current size is approximately 15. Maximum area of exterior patio, 200 square meters. Current size planned is approximately 60. So, so if we went to 20 and 100, we'd be fine. Yeah, 
whatever well, remembers. Yeah. 30 and 120. 30, 30 and 120, I think, would be more than adequate. It's only for the temporary oh. use period. And uh, if they want to extend beyond that with a rezoning, then they can certainly do whatever they feel they need. Exactly. So the only other one. Ma Maureen's got her hand up too. Okay. Sorry, um, uh, okay. So my uh, I don't have staff, Maureen. My question's for staff. And um, I understand, Daniel, that you and, and the proponents had that discussion about the the, the size that was needed and that what was in the GUP was actually um, uh, on the high end. So from your discussion with the proponents, Daniel, what do you see as figures that would work um, for the retail space and the patio space that's consistent with the discussion you have? Was that? Um, so when I originally drafted the TUP, we had the discussion that we would want to put some, like as staff, we want to put some limit on it to give assurance um, that it wouldn't expand, you know, greatly beyond the size proposed. And in that discussion, we talked about what the current size was. They didn't have plans to expand. Um, so in, in that case, the suggestion to put in a larger size um, came from you? Um, yes, but I think, but the idea to put in any size came from me as well. Okay. Um, so I was putting in a size that was, but thinking, okay, to give them some room to expand, but but to place a limit on that. Um, um, and I'm just hearing from the, from the applicant that they, they're they fine with having that restriction. Um, so as council is proposing is, it would not be a, a hindrance to them. So the restriction that's being proposed is, is what? Can you tell us again? In terms of square um, meters? Yeah, I mean, Gary's, people have talked about the, you know, the 20 square meters. I had 30 and 120, yeah. So is that correct, Daniel? 30 yeah. and 120? Okay, thank you. Um, hope if you, oh, sorry, Sue Ellen, go ahead. <clears throat> Yeah, I just wanted, I, I'm fine with doing it this way if people are happy with that. The 30 and the 120 for six and seven on the permit is great. I'm wondering about nine, which is the hours, um, which were of concern to people. And I'm looking at an email that we, um, uh, that came from Rob Purdy today, Cidery TUP hours, 11 to seven, seven days a week. Can I, we- I think that, built, that was built in by Daniel. Well, I'm looking at the it's not in the draft. It's an amendment. It's an amendment. It, it's in his report, I think. How about I read the All draft? Right. Right yeah, right. thank you. Hope, could you do that, please? <laughs> okay. So they cancel issue temporary use permit TUP 2021-0017 for cidery use at 620 Laura Road, legally described as Lot 1, Block B, District Lot 492, Plan 2250, PID 0152. 026 701 as amended by section six. So decrease the maximum size of retail space to 30 square meters. Uh, section seven, decrease the maximum size of picnic area to 120 square meters. And section nine included maximum hours of operation as Monday to Sunday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay, Sue Ellen. That's great. I didn't catch that. Thank you. That's great. I'll move this. Second. All right, you've moved it and the second to Maureen. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. That's unanimous. All right, let's uh, move on. Can I say that I'm going to bring something forward about process? Uh, process yeah. around yeah. this. So I'll talk to staff. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sue Ellen. And uh, so we're going to move to section seven, which is bylaws. I just, I just want to be aware of the time uh, involved here. And this is the use of and where we're at and where we're going. Use of public places bylaw and bylaw notice enforcement amending bylaw number 537 and 538, 2021. Daniel Martin, manager of planning and development, and Bonnie Brokenshire, manager of environment. Environment, pa Parks, Planning, and Interim Manager Bylaw Services. All right, you guys. We go. 
Hi, Bunny. <clears throat> Daniel, over to you. Yeah. He's frozen again. Is he? Daniel, you might have to turn your video off and we'll just hit listen to you. <clears throat> Where is he, by the way? <laughs> um, Gabriel. There he is. He's ah. back. He's back. Or is it Galliano? Galliano. Sorry. Daniel, maybe um, turn your video off. He's not done that. <laughs> Is there any chance we can read through the slide presentation? He's, oh. he's going to come back in again, I guess. There he is. Daniel, you there? No. You got to unmute. You. There we go. Can you turn your video off, Daniel? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. All right. Turn your, turn your there Sorry we go. Let's see if one. that, oh, there you go. I might do that. That's good. A little better sound wise. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll try this. Okay. Um, so tonight staff have a um, two bylaws. So a use of public places bylaw number 537 and a, a bylaw to amend the bylaw notice enforcement bylaw number 538. Um, so this stems from council direction given um, initially by an email poll on January 19th, where council directed staff to develop a bylaw to restrict camping and or the creation of encampments on public places. Um, so staff have prepared a bylaw accordingly, um, but just by way of background, so the power to regulate public places is given um, by the community charter. It's one of the fundamental powers that a municipality has, um, and so may regulate prohibit or impose requirements in relation to public places. Um, so one of the things that staff have done is looked at a number of bylaws in neighboring communities that regulate public places. Um, so looking at specifically those that prohibit um, camping in public places. So six of those bylaws regulated taking up temporary abode or erecting or cause to be erected any structure or tent. Um, and three of those bylaws then include exemptions for overnight shelter and the, the staff report discusses sort of where that exemption comes from and where the case law stands in relation to that. Um, in doing the overview of other bylaws, staff put together a list of sort of what are common other things that are regulated. And, um, yeah, other things that are regulated in public places. So some of them are sort of make sense in terms of you know, prohibit littering or dumping garbage or damaging trees or um, damaging buildings and fences and, and benches and um, following directions of municipal employees. So staff have prepared bylaw number 537 to regulate public places. Um, so one of the first things the bylaw has to do is regulate, well, what is a public place? Um, and so we took what it's fairly common, it's public places, it's parks, trails, beaches, greenways, playgrounds, streets, um, but it's for other property owned, held under the care, custody, or possession of the municipality. Um, it, the, the bylaw then prohibits um, taking up overnight shelter, um, with an exemption for overnight shelter for a homeless person, um, but we do limit that exemption so that it's not on a, within a structure right of way access road or um, municipal playground bike parks. Bylaw 537 contains a series of common regulations of public place as well. So it includes things like during damaging buildings, um, damaging vegetation, lighting fires, sound goods, using a loudspeaker on public places. And bylaw 537 also includes authority for staff to issue a permit for the use of a public place. That's been a longstanding municipal issue and um, objective and so this bylaw includes that as well. Bylaw 538 then is the bylaw enforcement notice and that gives us the ability for municipal staff to write enforcement notices for non-compliance with the bylaw um, with a range of penalties depending on the nature of the offense. And so the staff recommendation is to give first reading to both, both of these bylaws. All right, thank you, Daniel. Um, 
Uh, anybody else want to chime in on there? Um, Bonnie, have you got any comments? I'm just here to answer questions from council. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna to go to my list. I see uh, Sue Ellen there. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my, uh, I think this is great. It looks good to me having, uh, coming from a parks management background and uh, a little bit of enforcement uh, and education around um, managing people in parks. And uh, so I, I gather that this is public places. It looks good to me. I have one question about uh, amplified sound. I saw the word loudspeaker in there. Um, if people set up with some other kind of amplified sound, would this bylaw uh, permit you to um, manage that? Because sometimes it's a busker with an electric guitar or something like that, or something else that appears suddenly. And uh, I'm just wondering about the word loudspeaker. Can anybody answer my question about would this capture all amplified sound? Bonnie, would you be prepared to answer that? Sort of. I hate that I don't want to put you on the spot. But... We could we could look at that. I mean, you know, if it, your example, a busker, that would be amplified. Um, that would be a loudspeaker. Um, I can't really. A busker would have a license, though, wouldn't he? Depending, it's good. If yeah. Um, so I mean, also too, there's also layers in this. So there's other there's, there's other bylaws, such as the noise bylaw. Um, however, that doesn't. Um, yeah, I, I, it's a hard, it's a hard, we might look at the definition or some yeah. other being more explicit in, the, in okay. that particular uh, definition. All right, and I, I forgot to say it at the beginning that I'm speaking in favor and there might be the odd little tweak. That's the only reason I was bringing it up and that I'll be voting in favor of this bylaw as I understand it now, unless somebody else on council convinces me to vote otherwise. Thank you. Okay, um, Allison Morse. Oh, no, sorry, David first, and then Allison. Sorry. Okay, thank you very much, Gary. Um, thank you very much for doing this, um, um, uh, Daniel and Bonnie. I like it. I, I, I support it, uh, like Sue Ellen, but I've got two little things that I find seem to be going a little bit over the top. Um, so under the bylaw itself, uh, 3.2b, and this, I guess this is part of interfering with the use of a field or park, but it says I must... No, nobody must use any area for organized activity or sport. I really don't know what that means. I mean, does that mean if I, I need a permit to organize a soccer game for my family and friends on a field somewhere um, and I'd be up to, and somebody could give me a fine of 200 bucks for doing that? It seems a little extreme. Um, I get the idea if it's about interfering with the use of a field, you know, you shouldn't be getting in the way if somebody's already got a permit to do something or organizing something. And the other well, one yeah. is that we should not affix any ad or poster advertising an event. And that's how we find out about a lot of events is, you know, something on one of the telephone poles in the cove and there's, you know, Sherry's got another concert happening and I see it, oh, that's great. I didn't know about it. Um, so those are the only two things I find seem um, a little bit extreme. Um, any thoughts? <laughs> Staff, please. Yeah, that's good. Good one. There, Bonnie. Thanks, David. Those, those are good comments, Councillor Hawking. Um, the organized sport and the organized activity definitely was, you know, a little bit back and forth and did some research on that and did get some legal counsel opinions on that because it, you know, we don't want to restrict, just as you had said, a soccer game, an impromptu soccer game with your friends. That's not the intent. So the, the definition of organized sport means any game, sport or exercise activity, including yoga, which is carried out by 10 or more persons on a regular basis. So, yeah, so I, I don't know if that sort of answers it a little bit. It does, um, I looked in, that was in the definitions, I guess, and mm -hmm. I missed that. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, and as far as uh, posting bills, notices, those sort of things, um, it is under the section 3.2, which is um, sort of a little bit of discretion in that you, you can have a, a permit to do so. 
Um, you know, maybe that is over the top. It's an extra step for someone that wants to advertise a, an event, a concert, that sort of thing. But it would just be sort of a conversation and it, it does leave some discretion to the um, departmental manager um, who issues the permits. So yeah, we, we could look at uh, tweaking that for the next um, go round, the second, third reading. Um, I, I mean, I appreciate that there's obviously, you know, you're not going to be walking around uh, looking for uh, people to uh, um, pay fines. Um, it's just that once, once you have bylaws written that look extreme, um, then it starts being extreme by folks. So I'd be happy to hear what other people thought about those, but those are two bits that struck me as a bit over the top, but the rest of it I certainly liked and I really appreciate the work and I think this is important. Yeah, I think, uh, David, to your point, I, I agree it is sort of over, overreaching, but um, it's, it's better to have too much than not enough. You can tell about the enforcement is what it comes down to, right? Anyway, anyone else? Who's rattling papers? Not I can me. hear big, run, crunchy, so runchy both noises my, both my every hands. once in a while. Yeah, no. Um, it was, I... I Sort of dis, you know. I think David. To, to, okay, who is that? Pick up um, games and sport it's games and stuff. Ah, oh, no, that's uh, the Pronzi's eating up there. I know. Um, pick up soccer game or pick up baseball game. I don't think is what's being prohibited by what. If I'm reading the definitions correctly. Um, this is for first reading, so we could make some changes before second reading. I think we should go ahead with first reading. My two questions had to do with, in a quick read and not comparing the use of streets bylaw and we're having to do a new fire bylaw, um, there's often, I think there's some things that are picked up in the use of streets bylaw that are also in here. And things like lighting fires on beaches and things like that. I'm not sure if that isn't picked up in the, in a fire bylaw. So it's just a matter of maybe looking at those other things to see that if they're duplicated, they say the same thing. Um, so I think we should go ahead and give this first reading. Thank you, Allison. And over to Maureen. In the interest of time. Thank you. Uh, I'm prepared to support this on for first reading, but I really do think it goes beyond what we were looking for. We, we started when we were talking about this discussion you know, and the direction from council was to deal with camping and erecting shelters in public spaces. This goes way past that. And uh, I'm, I don't know if I'm comfortable with it. And I, I, I think that putting something in place that uh, requires a raft of enforcement um, yeah. that, that isn't going to happen is, um, is, is not a wise strategy. The, the second um, point is um, uh, in the development of this bylaw, does, does this, do we obtain public feedback on this at some point? Does it have to go for public consultation? It's a regulatory bylaw, so it doesn't necessarily have to go for public comment, but um, I think I'll defer should. to, yeah, I'll defer to other, yeah, to council. Um, and it is, it is Liam here, if I, if I may make a comment. Hi, Liam. Hello, council. Um, sorry, I can't be on Zoom. The Wi-Fi doesn't allow for it where I am. Um, but just wanted to make a comment uh, about Councillor Nicholson's uh, comment about uh, this being much more comprehensive than what was originally directed uh, by Council to staff. And staff, um, and largely that's uh, in part from my direction to staff too, and that when we started talking about it, we it was recognition that there was a lot of um, work that was wanting to uh, be done around the use of public spaces that had never been gotten to. And that 
when looking into it and researching other municipal bylaws around regulating public um, spaces and the use of public spaces, this is a very standard suite of authority uh, and regulations that uh, most, if not all municipalities have. And so it was really, a, I see it as a housekeeping measure to bring our standard of care up to uh, uh, sort of standard operating level for a municipality to regulate its public spaces. So I do agree it, it goes farther than what the initial direction was from council, but uh, uh, I think it was done with the best of intent. Um, I'm sure I'm sure it was. Um, I just wonder if between first and second reading staff could go through it with a red oh, pen. Just first. And, and think about whether there are some elements of this that just go a little bit beyond what we, we need on Bowen Island. Um, uh, some of them, I mean- there's... Yeah. I just, um, I would argue that these are just tools and whether we use these tools or not, um, they are in place because there's people have had to use them in the past. That's all. That's all I'm thinking. I think I think the more the more the better. And it's all about the enforcement part of it. Anyway, sorry, Maureen, I interrupted you. Back to you. Well, I just I, I think that we would get public feedback on this and probably deservedly. Um, I mean, there there are lots of bits and pieces in here. So, for example, um, there's a fireworks prohibition. In, in this um, bylaw, and uh, uh, it, it gets buried in, in the bylaw. And there's some folks who would be very supportive of a fireworks prohibition, and there would be others who were um, less so. But I, I think people should know what's in the bylaws. Um, Bonnie, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Nichols. I just wanted to say that it's not a, it's not a prohibition. It, it, it is permitted with permit. On public land. Where does it say permit? It's under section. Um, it's under section three point two. Well, that's all the prohibitions. And then Allison six point one is the yeah. permit. Is the permit? Yeah. Well, you see, you list all the prohibitions, but you you should say subject to permit right there because people will just get their back up and not go any further. Yeah, that legal counsel changed that around, and I agree with you. It's a little bit confusing, but it is uh, subject to permit. Yeah. Yeah. So just subject to permit, I, I just uh, on number A there, performance ceremony, uh, if we were to have the, um, the ceremony down at the, down at the, this citadel down at the, by the ferry there, sorry, what the, uh, Armistice Day. Armistice Day, yeah. Um, so we need a permit for that, or we probably ought, or do we need a permit now? Because that's quite a gathering. Use of streets requires a permit now for a parade and that sort of stuff. We get yeah, one okay. at Tour Tourism Bowen always gets one for um, the light up the cove. Okay. So right now, if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's an event taking place on the street, we have a permit in the traffic use of streets bylaw, and if it's an um, activity taking place in a park or on municipal property, we, we don't have a permit process for it. We've done some through the traffic and use of streets bylaw, which isn't really its intended function. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, okay, um, were you finished there, Maureen? Oh, now Gary's frozen. Okay, no, I just was watching to see if Maureen was finished or not. Okay, then it's over to Sue Ellen. Okay, thank you. Just a, a couple more things. Um, one of them is the library board, which I'm on, uh, discuss, discussed this uh, last week, um, just briefly that they had met with staff and Bonnie and Liam had come down. And anyway, you guys had uh, talked together, which was wonderful to hear. Um, the library board is, um, as I understand it, and I can't speak for them because I didn't prepare anything with them, but. Um, the words that I've got written down from that meeting are bookable space. They might be uh, in be, the, the library uses their grounds, uh, the grounds as um, 
uh, learning grounds. So there's programming happens there, for example, in this summer reading camp, and maybe in the future there will be more uh, outdoor readings or uh, events that, like the Reconciliation Day that was held a couple of years ago and things like that. Anyway, they need to be able to um, uh, manage their grounds and it's amazing how often sometimes people come and put things on it. And uh, so um, I'm glad that staff have talked to them. I think the uh, idea of emerging uses for uh, parks and public spaces is something we may need uh, to manage in the future to make sure that um, it's not, uh, that some new program isn't uh, stopped by some other unauthorized use that's not happening there. So I just, I like the idea of uh, having bylaws and then we can, if we find, you can always um, not enforce parts of it. You can set a uh, bylaw po enforcement policy that prioritizes this, that, and the other. So it's not necessarily like you have to enforce every one of them to the same degree. And uh, so I'd welcome staff's input about uh, that. But the idea of, um, yes, they would become bylaws, but uh, no, you don't have to spend all your resources enforcing all of them all the time. Bonnie? Bonnie, yeah. I could just kind of go back. Uh, Councillor Nicholson uh, raised a good point um, about, you know, is there going through and looking at the provisions. And when I was drafting the bylaw, I really did that with a fine tooth comb because I've worked in bylaws for 10 years. These are all issues that have come up yeah. over time and we've had no tools to deal with them. And, you know, as I said, you know, picking flowers, we're not gonna go out when kids are making daisy chains and picking but <laughs> if someone goes and cuts the flowers all down on the, in the garden gateway, then we have a tool. Um, we also have, um, you know, great dance classes in Veterans Park. We have no bylaw right now that allows us to permit that activity, which we want people to use our parks, but we also need to have some liability and, and those sort of things in place. So it really is has been a gap from the staff perspective and um, maybe some of the provisions look a little draconian, um, bylaws can look that way, but um, they are all issues. I took out a lot of the stuff that I just didn't think was relevant for Bowen. And these provisions do sort of, they have been issues that have been raised, most of them over the last 10 years that I've seen. Thank you, Bonnie, that's a good point. Sue Ellen, any more? Nope, that's it for me, thank you. Okay, Allison, and then we'll try to wrap well, up. Yeah, I think we should just give this first reading. I guess my major concern is if you've got rules that say they can't do it, then you're gonna have to enforce it. It's, it's just, you know, there's no point in having a rule and then just saying, oh, can't be bothered. And that's why with 3.2, I'd really like to say, you know, it says except is provided for in 3.3, but 3.3 isn't the exception, the permit stage. So um, I, I'll make the motion to give it first reading and I would add to that motion, um, if I can find a motion, that um, it be referred to for public comment. Is that good with everybody? So I would move the use of public places bylaw and bylaw notice enforcement amending bylaw number 537 and 538 2021. Daniel Martin, manager of planning and development of Bonnie Bromwich. Oh, why don't I read the recommendation and study agenda item? I move that bylaw number 537 2021 cited as Bone Island Municipality use of public places bylaw number 537 2021 be read a first time and the bylaw number 529 2021 cited as Bone Island Municipal bylaw notice enforcement bylaw number 196 2008 amendment bylaw number 538 2021 be read a first time and that the bylaws be referred for public comment. Thank you, Allison. I'll second that. And any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That's great. Thank you. And uh, then we will move on to utility cost recovery. Staff reports. Daniel Martin. Can I make a comment? Sorry? On process, please. Um, uh, we, yes. We, we've got a couple of things that are, I think, time sensitive in that the variance permits that people are hanging here waiting. And we're now at 830. Could we um, change the order of 8.1 and put it down to with 
I don't have a problem with that. Anybody else have an issue with that? Okay, well, that's good. Let's do that. Thank you, Allison. So we're going to move 8.1 down to what? 8.5? Yeah. Okay. And uh, it's not that it's not important, Daniel. It's just that uh, there might be somebody waiting for this other stuff. So we're going to go to 8.2, which is Development Variance Permit Application DVP 2020 0016. 91 Fairweather Road, Mike Lightbody, Daniel Martin, Manager of Planning Development, uh, date of February 22nd, 2021. Now, uh, just as we get into these, there's two very similar development variance permits here, which Daniel will discuss. And then there was a third part, Daniel, that you're prepared to talk about today? Yes. Okay, then, uh, and Council Morse will be... Um, uh, recusing herself for that session. So we'll do, go through the first two first, and then we'll start with the last one. So we're on uh, 8.2, Daniel, and away you go. Okay, let me just get this set up. Okay. Sorry for the delay, so thank you. So I have two, as the mayor said, two variance permits, both in the same strata, in the Fairweather strata on the south coast of Bowen with, with fairly similar um, variance application requests. So the first one is 1291 Fairweather, um, located on the, the south coast of Bowen Island. Um, the site is zoned RR1C, um, so a zone variation in the rural residential zone. Um, so the rural residential zone allows a maximum combined lot coverage of all buildings and structures of 100 square meters plus 3.5% of the lot area. So this is for all three um, rural residential zones. Um, and the, I'll just add the RR1C zone variation allows for a smaller side yard setback. So it allows for a three meter side yard setback instead of the 7.5 side yard um, front and rear setback. So the DVP, DVP application at 1291 Fairweather is asking for an increase in the lot coverage to 300 square meters from the allowable 232. Um, so the, this site is currently developed at 292, currently has 292 square meters of lot coverage. So they're over the existing allowable lot coverage and they're asking for a small increase um, to construct a storage area on the rear of an existing carport. They, um, the variance would also ask for a reduction in the front yard setback to three meters. Um, so a reduction from the 7.5 meters required for a front um, and reduced from the four meters where the current carport is. Okay, hey, thanks, Daniel. Um, so for, for both of these um, variances, what I'll go through and the second presentation has a, a longer discussion of sort of a historical background of the lot coverage for this, this strata. Um, and so for both of them, staff have presented alternatives in terms of proceeding with the two applications on their merit um, as presented by council, as presented to council to proceed or second to proceed with the two applications and direct staff to include an amended lot coverage formula. So that's the second part that Gary had talked about. And that's um, the part I have to leave the meeting for. So please stop talking about it. Well, and the third <laughs> being for council to, to reject the applications um, as they see fit. And so the recommendation for this variance is that notice be given that the DVP um, 0016 will be considered by council at its meeting of April 26th, and that council will authorize staff to give notice to properties within 100 meters of 1291 Fairweather. Thank you, Daniel. So on this one, uh, is everybody clear with what's happening here? Allison, do you want to go ahead and start it then? Start what? Oh, sorry, I didn't. I didn't have my hand up. I didn't mean to. Oh, okay. Then sorry. I'll go to Sue, Sue Ellen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll be uh, voting against uh, this development permit uh, variance, uh, as I usually do for coastal. Uh, development variance permits. And I spoke to that at the last meeting when I was introducing the idea of coastal uh, development permit areas. Um, 
I want to uh, draw council's attention to the fact that um, that area of fair weather is already in a coastal, uh, sorry, in an environmentally sensitive area, development permit area defined in the official community plan. And uh, so this is like uh, Cape Roger Curtis and all of those um, uh, coastal bluff kinds of uh, ecosystem there. Um, it's uh, valuable, rare, uh, disappearing, and um, already uh, defined as a development permit area by our official community plan. I think I just said that, sorry about that. So um, my thinking is that rules change uh, and uh, now we have a land use bylaw that everybody else on Bowen goes by. Um, I think uh, climate change is coming upon us and uh, all of the um, increasing the lot coverage and uh, reducing the setbacks makes it more difficult for vegetation around uh, the house and grounds to um, persist in hotter, drier summers. And, uh, and may become more of a fire danger, that kind of thing. I think it's, uh, um, I'm thinking about songbirds and alligator lizards and all those things that also uh, we like on to have on Bowen Island and that uh, people, um, I'm thinking about our preserve and protect um, mandate of the island's trust that we belong to and uh, the views from the water. This is already, fair weather is already the part of uh, Bowen Island's coastline uh, well, as well as some other areas. But anyway, it's already <clears throat> perhaps more like West Vancouver or other urban areas uh, than other parts of Bowen that have been developed more recently. So the idea of um, uh, increasing lot coverage and uh, adding more uh, buildings and um, development to, a, uh, to our shorelines um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm opposed. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, David. Thank you, Gary. I'll be voting in favor. This is, um, this is a historical quirk in terms of the size of the, uh, you know, that, so it's, <clears throat> and this is not any giant extension of the property. It's a tiny little thing up on the back, going up the hill. It's not, uh, getting any closer to the water. Uh, so it's, it's really so small and the, you know, the limit that was originally, the house was originally built to, um, um, by, by, by changing that, it just makes it, in both of these examples, it just, you know, not, makes it not fair to the property owners. And the, the, the difference um, here is so small uh, that I just don't see how we can object that that's going to damage the shoreline in any way. So I, I'm, I see this as very small. It's almost housekeeping, and I would be voting in favor. Thank you, David. Allison? I just wanted to say, I think Councillor Fast might change her mind if she actually saw where this is being proposed to go on a site visit. As uh, Councillor Hawking says, it's a small addition, a storage area in an area that was driveway before. So it's not um, taking any pristine greenfield and turning it into a storage shed and it's on the north side of the house. Thank you, Allison. Michael? We lost Michael. Uh, Michael, there we no, go. Uh, you found me. Um, this is a very small extension over what was, I think, gravel. Was was it was it a gravel or or rough gravel. ground? Gravel. Gra over gravel, and uh, you know, and and I think the reason for doing this, looking at the architecture, is obvious, and uh, I can see why the owner would want to do it. So you know, I. I as someone said, I think um, Councillor Moore said, facing north. So really, um, yes, I'll, I'll certainly be happy to support this very, very small addition to this house. And I do understand, I think I can see looking at the architecture and the drawings, which are very clear, why they would want to do this. And uh, I can't, frankly, to see no real reason to object. And in fact, I'm going to support it. Thank you, Michael. Maureen? Thank you. I'll, I'll also be supporting it. Um, but I, I did have a question. Um, Councillor Morris is recusing herself from part of this discussion. 
Not, not this part. Not the, this part of it. The following part. The following part. And, yeah. and for, for what reason? The land use bylaw proposal change would, would include my property. But yeah. I can't see either. I'm nowhere near adjacent to them. They're, you know. That's okay. I was just asking because I thought it might be confusing to the public. Yeah. Thank you. Is that it, Maureen? Okay, so the recommendation is that notice be given that council will be considering the issuance of development variance permit DVP 2021-0016 for the variance of maximum lot coverage for 1291 Fairweather Road, legally described as Strata Lot 2, District Lot 1550, Strata Plan VR704, together with an interest in the common property in proportion to the unit entitlement of the Strata Lot, as shown on Form 1, PID 005680, 116 at the April 26, 2021 meeting of council. And the council authorized staff to give notice for the consideration the issuance of development variance from DVP 2021-0016 in accordance with section 499 of the local government act to all properties within 100 meters of the legal boundary of 1291 Fairweather Road legally described as strata lot 2 district lot 1550 strata plan VR704 together with an interest common property in proportion to the unit entitlement of the strata lot as shown on form one PID 005-680-116. I move that. Second. Second. Thank you, David. All in favor, aye. 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 And opposed? Councillor Fast. Thank you in opposition. And then we're going to move down to 8.3, which is the the next one, the development variance permit DVP 2021-0009 for 1195 for Road. And uh, that's Mike Lightbody and Daniel Martin, Manager of Planning and Development. Okay, Daniel, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the second variance permit from the strata, same strata is for 1195 Fairweather. Um, so this is about in the middle of the strata, still on the south coast of Bowen Island. Um, and this is a currently vacant site or vacant in terms of a house um, was destroyed by a fire on this site. So some of the, the site infrastructure remains like the same entrance and stairways down and the foundation of an existing house. Um, so same as the other one, the site is zoned RR1C. So this has the lot coverage calculation of 100 square meters and 3.5% of the lot area. Um, so the, the applicant um, spoke to council at the start of this meeting, but but the intent is there to, to develop the site in a way that maximizes the existing foundation and the existing disturbed footprint. Um, but so the application is to increase the lot coverage to 296 square meters from the allowable 225 and to reduce the side yard setback to 0 0.45 meters from the allowable three meters. And that's again to, to sort of use the existing foundation of the, the former house. Um, although this, this application originally in, involved some development within the setback to the sea, and in response to staff feedback, they amended their application to remove um, anything from within the setback to the sea. And, um, and that's so the staff recommendation is that notice be given of this variance permit at the for the April 26th meeting and staff be authorized to give notice as well to people within 100 meters of 1195 Fairweather. All right, thank you, Daniel. And uh, open it up with Maureen. Sorry, that's from last item. Okay, any comments from anybody? Michael? Um, it strikes me and I'm familiar with this site. It, it's an extremely I, when I say difficult, it's an extremely challenging site, uh, particularly challenging. And it seems to me, Daniel, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking for your input here, that the architect to, to build this home has had really to work around, firstly, the existing, the existing, what was the existing framework of the building, and then secondly, all the very awkward topography that it's faced. This is, this is really quite a challenging architectural situation. So what they've done, if I'm correct, is they've made the most of the location without going trampling all over everywhere and to basically to, tie, to tidy it up. 
uh, and to make a uh, building of a house of this nature possible. A am I correct in saying that the, the architects, this, this formation is really driven out of, out of some form of, uh, of keen architectural desire? I mean, it's definitely like a, a constrained site between the, the setbacks um, and the desire to use the existing foundation, existing house siting and not use where some of the, the stairways are higher up the site um, and also a desire to keep the house lower. So rather than an option could have been a smaller footprint and a higher building, um, but, but partly the, the architect and the applicant or the owner felt like at that point, the, the house itself would be more visible from, from higher up, like from the roadway and keeping the house lower profile um, fit better into the landscape. Mm. Well, then I must say in view of the evident care that I think has been demonstrated, I'll certainly support this application at this stage. Thank you, Michael. David? Yes, thank you, uh, Gary. I, two things. I wanted to thank staff for rejecting the additional development on the waterfront side, so that was good because now I understand that's going up on the, the upside. Um, and I'm supporting this again because of the historical quirk. They're planning to build it on the, the foundation where the house used to be, and it, it used to be legal. It then became not legal just because of you know, changes, but to now move to a different site would just, or sorry, to change the, uh, um, uh, the building would end up damaging a lot more than using the same foundation over again, as I understand it. So um, unless I'm mistaken in my understanding of this, I am in support of this. Okay, thank you, David. Sue Ellen? Just that I'll be voting against this motion for the same reasons. And I don't see it, I, I mean, I think things do change. Rules do change, attitudes change and um, I think that, uh, for example, um, Canada has uh, signed on to a UN uh, proposal to bring ecocide into a um, criminal international criminal court, and uh, you know, there's that's an extreme example for this. However, uh, at the Bowen level, um, ten years ago. It changed in that it's also part of this uh, environmentally sensitive area development permit area. We've already gone some way towards that. And uh, I can see in the future uh, restoration happening on patches of the site rather than, again, um, just building the same thing again. Because situations change, uh, climate change is upon us. We're in a, uh, an extinction event. And uh, we're an island that cares about its shorelines according to the public input that we've received over the past. So that's why I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Sue Ellen. Any further discussion? I'll read the recommendation. Uh, I, Gary. Yeah, this, sorry, Rob. Yeah, sorry. I missed Daniel, you there. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, Daniel, can you just comment on Council Hawking's comment that it looks like if we actually restricted this, we will potentially there would be more damage to the land because they'd have to reconfigure things around. Is that is that the general understanding? Um, I think it, it's hard to predict, I guess, what they would do. Like if council turned down the variance and asked them to stay, you know, their message was to stay at the, the allowable lot coverage. Um, I think either they'd be building higher or, or potentially yeah, reconfiguring what happens on the site. And then it, it's hard to tell at that point how they would develop. So the current foundation is about at, at, at the size that they want to redevelop at right now. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hey, thank you, Rob. So I'm gonna read the, um, the recommendation here, which is the notice be given the council will be considering the issuance of development variance for DVP 2021-0009 for the variance of lot coverage and side yard setback for 1195 for with a road legally described Strata Lot 14, District Lot 1550, Strata Lot VR704, PID 005 681 103, at the April 26, 2021 meeting of council. And the council authorized staff to give notice for the consideration of issuance of developments variance permit 
DVP 2021-0009 in accordance with section 499 of the Local Government Act to all properties within 100 meters of the legal boundary of 1195 Fairweather Road legally described as Strata Lot 14, District Lot 1550, Strata Plant, VR 704, PID 005-681-103. I move that. Second. Second. Thank you, Michael. And further discussion? I don't see. All in favor? Aye. And opposed? Councillor Fast in opposition. Thank you. Uh, so how do you want to do this now? Um, I'm going to step away for two minutes. Excuse me. Okay. And um, Allison, you're going to, are we going to discuss this now? Daniel's, Daniel? If Daniel's going to proceed with his third comment, then um, I'm going to leave the meeting. Because the land use bylaw amendments would affect me as well as the rest of the strata. No, I understand that. Daniel, do you want to do that now or do you want to do it? I mean, Mr. May, it's part of my report and part of my presentation, and it's what I normally would have done as part of the, the discussion of the variance permit. Yeah. Um, so I'm prepared to discuss if, if that's what council wants to, to hear more of that portion. Well, I'll leave the meeting while you guys decide whether you're going to discuss it or not. Where do I find the box? Councillor Morse, can you state for the record the reason why you're leaving? Because the proposed... Um, amendments to the land use bylaw would affect my property as well as the rest of the stratus prop lots. Thanks, Allison. <clears throat> okay, we'll just wait for Sue Ellen for a second. Now, how do you want to get this order back in here? Um, uh, I'm we've got uh, about 33 minutes left here until we have to declare an extension. And um, I'd like to get through this tonight, but we'll see how everybody feels. Um, oh, let's just go. Okay, we got Sue Ellen back. Uh, Daniel, why don't you start the conversation? There, Sue Ellen's back now. Daniel, if you're ready. Okay. No, I'm not anything now presentation in terms of these two okay how's that yeah that's Can good for me again okay yeah um so these are two two similar applications for lot coverage increases in the same area that all both have the same issues um and at the same time we've been approached by i think two other applicants with similar inquiries um and as the staff report says we generally staff don't support is to law coverage as a variance. Um, but, but in this case, we have kind of this formula. So staff had proposed in the report three options for council. So one is to proceed with the two variance permits on their merits and sort of other future applicants in the strata could proceed as well. Proceed with the two applications, but Additionally, direct staff to include an amended lot coverage formula in our housekeeping bylaw for the strata um, to set a new lot coverage formula for these lots, given their smaller size and their rural um, status and, and determine an appropriate lot coverage formula. And then at that point, we would have set a new lot coverage amount, and then we would be discouraging people to apply for variances beyond that that new amount. Um, and the third option which council to date, that would be to reject the applications and inform future applicants that that know on it. Um, so the report gives some background into the lot coverage for these lots. And so under the Islands Trust bylaw number, number 36, the zoning bylaw, they were designated as settlement residential. Um, and so with that, they had a allowable lot coverage of the lot. Um, in adopting Bowen Island Municipalities Land Use File number 57, they were instead moved into a rural bridge formula. Um, so this had the effect of reducing the allowable lot coverage. So to somewhere between about 15% or about a quarter 
of the allowable lot coverage. So they all saw significant reductions um, and all of the houses that were built under Islands Trust bylaw now exceed the allowable lot coverage um, in some cases significantly. So essentially all of the, all of the homes that were built are now legally non-conforming. Um, if they are to be destroyed, they can't be rebuilt unless with a variance permit or, or a smaller amount. Um, so the option to consider for council would be to direct staff to include an amendment to the zone variation to the RR1C zone. Having an alternative uh. for uh, variation. Daniel, you there? Yeah. I'm there. You're a little bit. Uh, you're a little bit bubbly at the end there. Okay. Should, uh, so, are you recommending that we, as council, recommend that change um, to help procedurally with uh, the, the the land use planning? What happened is uh, they, I guess, they zoned all these lots and made 14, 14 of the houses that were going to be. Uh, legally non-conforming because they were built at a certain point and then they had the zoning change which was a way smaller and so they were all too big or the side lots coverage or whatever so what daniel's recommending is that they go back to a more sensible zoning and then they won't have to apply for anything in the future so is that the basis of it daniel I, and i don't know why are you recommending that as as a planning director or should I they? I don't think it goes far as saying I'm right recommending it. I would say I'm presenting it as an option. And what I've been trying to, to sort of discover and can't find a record of it is if it was an intentional change of the council in 2002 or if it was an oversight. Um, so if it was an intentional council move, that's a legitimate you know, like policy decision to reduce the zoning on a lot, as opposed to if it was just an oversight and, and nobody noticed at the time that these lots were smaller and would have issues with the lot coverage. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. What about, um, what about the involvement of the, of the strata in this? Like, shouldn't they sort of agree that they, they'd like to do this and then apply? I mean, that would be another option for council would, would be not, not direct us to make a change and just invite the strategy to apply. Yeah. Okay, let's take it to the uh, group here. Maureen? Not sure I entirely followed all of that and the, the sound was, was, was rough. Um, so stop me if I go off on the wrong footing here. So what we have before us is we've got the two um, variance permit applications, one of which is a small addition, and the other is um, building a home where a home has burned down. And now we're being asked to consider whether the way we handle those two can be option, 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 but one of them being um, applied more broadly to properties where there has been no request to make any change. Is, is that correct? Um, yeah, it essentially through a, yeah, to make a, a new lot coverage formula for the strata as a whole for that zone variation. Yeah, well, personally, I don't think we should be proactively setting new lot coverage formulas for a strata that hasn't approached us um, to have, have that discussion. So I think of the three options that you identified. Um, could you bring those those up again, Daniel, the, the, the three options that you had summarized? I just wanna make sure I'm talking about the right one. Is that, do you see that okay? Yeah. Um, Okay. 
Sorry, Martin, can you see that okay? Yes, yes, yeah. I can. So I, I think I'm favoring option one. Okay. Is that it, Maureen? Yes. Okay, I think uh, David, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Gary. So as my understanding, when I read, read through the report, so my understanding is these lots are small because there's got a whole lot of common property up above. So right. you know, the lots are small, you know, these are large houses, but, the, um, but they're all non-conforming right now because you know, the rules changed, but they made them small so that they could have that big chunk of common property up above. So when I read this, I was, um, I was favoring option two to, okay, let's fix this a bit. However, I'm not prepared to do that right now just because it's getting late and I couldn't hear Daniel very well and I need to really understand the ramifications of this. So I, while I'm favoring number two um, from, <clears throat> from my reading, um, I, I'm, I need to better understand what the consequences would be for other areas. And uh, yeah, I, it's, a bit <clears throat> it's a bit complex um, to, do, to agree with two right now, though I'm leaning in that direction, but I need, I need a better understanding of what this actually means for any other work that we're doing on the island. Okay, thanks, David. I, I think to David's point, I, I think you're right. I think it should go to the strata and they should uh, they should apply to do the um, to do the change in the uh, zoning. Uh, so I got uh, Sue Allen, please, and then uh, Michael. Sure, I'll keep it quick. Um, I uh, I think it's an error to um, assume that there was an oversight made. Uh, you know, I, it seems a funny place to start from. Um, I know you'd said you'd check, uh, Daniel, but I'm wondering why we would even do that. Um, why would the municipality conduct the rezoning on the behalf of people who haven't applied for it? You know, and uh, and we don't. Uh, would we then be doing that for other? neighborhoods or groups of people on the island it, it doesn't make sense to me and I, th I think um, we've got a lot still on our agenda and it's already chain late and this motion can wait um, so uh, I think we should if we want to we could postpone it to a future meeting this discussion or and just, that, to, or well, just like go move. with option one I beg your pardon or just go with option one I'm sorry, I can't see them anymore, so I don't know what it is. Option one is, 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 is basically leaving things as they are, Sue Ellen. If people want to bring anything forward, they bring it forward just, just like we had already today. It might save some workload in the planning department, that's for sure. Is this the, uh, same, Ellen, as is the, is this the same as the alternatives that are in the report? Because option one has two parts. And the second part is that council directs staff to include an amendment, uh, establishing an alternative lot coverage formula. Not that one. That's, the one, just that's the one. number two. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, so on the presentation, I put that as number two. Oh, okay. So it's a that's different second part. Right. Okay. Hey, Michael, can uh, are you finished, Will? Michael, if you got a comment, and well, let's put this to bed somehow. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you about putting it to bed, Gary. I, I Frankly, I'd like to know a little bit more rather than take a decision on the fly. Uh, maybe yeah. there was a good reason why these three alternatives suggested. And I'm wondering, because the, 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 what we decide has other ramifications, do you think we could possibly just defer this so we could learn a bit more rather than be forced to one, two or three hold back, learn a bit more, and then we can, we can discuss it with a, with a better informed uh, point of view. And I'd like to hear from the strata as well. Yeah, I, I certainly don't think this is an urgent call, this one. We've got some much more urgent stuff on the, uh, on the plate right now. Um, Hope, what do you, how do you want to deal with this? We're just going to uh, defer. I don't think, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think any actions required. Um, it wasn't a recommendation before council. It was an alternative. And Council's already um, passed motions with respect to the two DVPs. So I think yes. it can just be noted in the minutes that further discussion at a later date, if required. That sounds perfect to me. 
Now, I'd like to go back to 8.1. You could call Allison back. I don't know where she is. I can send her a text. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, 8.1, which is utility cost recovery, Daniel Martin, manager of planning and development, and Patrick Graham, who's been sitting in the wings very patiently, director of engineering, date of March 8th, 2021. You want to start it off, Daniel? <clears throat> or do you want Patrick to go ahead on it? His, his audio might be better. Daniel's frozen out again. <laughs> Patrick, you want to start this up? We've lost Daniel again. Sorry, Patrick, we can't hear you. Do you want to hop off and hop back in? Daniel, the same thing. I guess again. Uh, how's everybody feel about, uh, well, we got a little pause in the action. Here. Are you waiting for me? Uh, no. Oh, okay. I, got, I had back. some funny little note on my screen, which didn't make any sense, but I could release something. Now I was connected and I'm going, what? Okay. It's just rejoining now. <laughs> okay. We'll see if, we'll see if that works out. Um, okay. Patrick, how are you doing there now? Hello. There, that's good. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, so we have a local service area expansion policy that was um, adopted in 2016 um, to lay out uh, terms for expanding service area boundaries. Um, there's a couple of issues that this um, update is meant to address. Um, one is uh, the equity. Um, when you have different types of land uses, uh, the previous or the, the current uh, policy um, assigns the same um, contributions to joining a utility to uh, any property. So um, in places like Cove Bay, you have certain properties that uh, put a lot more load on utilities than others. So rather than having the contribution calculated on a per property basis, um, we're proposing to change that to a, um, um, a per population equivalent basis. Um, and I'll provide a a couple of examples just to uh, show the difference. The other thing that um, the, the other main revision is that um, in addition to expansion of boundaries, um, so adding properties to a utility area boundary, uh, load on the utilities is also increased when properties within the current boundary are rezoned or when they're subdivided and additional density is, is developed. Um, so we're proposing that that um, be treated in the same manner. Um, I'm just gonna share the screen with you. Yeah. Um, Can you see that? Not yet. No. no. Oh boy. <laughs> there it is. I got it now. Coming. Um, okay, so Allison's here. So um, in terms of the current policy, looking at a few example uh, developments that are 
in the near term, uh, and then also comparing that with what a single family house would be. Um, currently, they're, they're all um, an, a single property and um, would pay um, six, 16,800 per property. Mm -hmm. um, if we're weighting that according to population equivalent, then you have multifamily um, housing units like Birch would, uh, would pay substantially more. Um, and then the other, the other column is looking at wastewater treatment plant upgrades, what those would be. Um, essentially, that's not proposing to change. Um, we would be calculating wastewater contributions based on, um, well, essentially the same metric per population equivalent. Um, you're dividing the estimated cost of the future upgrades by the population equivalent that you're adding. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, if we look at going back to previous discussions about wastewater costs, and we were looking at about an $8.8 .8 million, that's the best we have at this point, the last D estimate for our long-term upgrades, that's to accommodate uh, about 843 people. Um, so you end up with a 10,400 per person contribution. Uh, a single family house would be uh, on average 2.5. So that would be a, a $26,000 contribution. Um, and then the contribution to Cove Bay Water would be roughly half of that in this example. The other um, part of this recommendation, which hasn't been fleshed out yet, is to um, get some direction to develop a development cost charges bylaw for the Snug Cove sewer system. Um, what the service area expansion policy is intended to do is to capture boundary expansions or increased density through rezoning or subdivision. But um, there isn't really a mechanism currently that we have for properties that are currently within a service area that are developing according to the current zoning. Um, so a, a development cost charge is a typical mechanism that municipalities use for that purpose. Um, so we don't have a um, presentation laying out all the highlights of the revised policy um, and uh, letter, Daniel's letter to council. Um, those are the main changes though. The other item that's been added is that um, an expansion can be initiated by the municipality. It doesn't necessarily have to be initiated by a petition from okay. residents. So um, for example, if we were looking at, you know, a, a Cove Bay expansion to include Eagle Cliff and other properties that may be something that the municipality would be um, coordinating and initiating. Um, Daniel, am I missing anything significant that you think I should be, we should be uh, flagging here? I don't know if you're good, Dan. Oh, good. Excellent. Um, Patrick, I just caught the tail end when I could come back in. So I'm not. Okay. I'm not. Does, that, does anybody have any um, questions about the proposed changes? I do. Allison, first, I guess. Um, I've been emailing Daniel and Patrick. Oh, wh why have we got all these back feed? Try that now. It's, That's better. Okay. Um, I've been emailing Daniel and Patrick several questions. And um, so when we developed the policy in the first place, 
it was entirely to deal with boundary expansions, not dealing with any properties adding to the system that were vacant properties that were already in the systems. And it did get referred to the water advisory committees for comment and discussion. I think some changes were made at that, you know, because of the input they made. Um, so I, I don't, I'm given the hour and given the number of questions I've got about this, I don't want to um, adopt the policy tonight. Um, I've, I've sent Raj a question as to whether we can even legally do some, some of what is in there with the subdivision approval, for example. Um, and then the other question is this bit about benefiting properties that we have to put in the financial contribution as a council. I don't think we, we haven't talked about that. Um, equivalent contribution from the general fund. And then the other question is just using population equivalent. Um, it makes sense maybe in Cove Bay, but you could use unit equivalent as well, um, number of um, units. I mean, what's, and there's no guidelines in the policy as to how you would calculate population equivalent. Um, so people aren't going to know just what it's about. So, um, I would like to refer this out to the water committees for comment, and that'll give us time to deal with some of the other questions that I've raised. And otherwise, I'm happy to raise them all and get answers all over the next half hour. Yeah, I don't. Um, I don't know if that's the route to take tonight. How urgent is this, Patrick? Um, it it's not. Super urgent. It's just could, could we bring it back to the next council meeting? I think there's a, there's too much discussion about it, and uh, the, the problem the other problem we have is a communication problem tonight. No, we so, can't really hear Daniel properly. We can't really hear people, and I think this is very important. And I think we should. Wait. But I will go to the three people that have got their hands up just for confirmation. Rob, he's he's out. Okay, Sue Ellen. You're muted. Sure, I'm happy to discuss it later. I just had a few questions around could could conservation pricing, you know, things I can ask at another meeting. Okay. Um, oh, I, I propose, do you want a motion, Mr. Chair? Well, let's talk to David and then we'll, I'll ask, I'll come back to you for a motion. Uh, thank you, Gary. I'm, I, um, I agree, I like this whole thing, um, except for I've got one part that I completely disagree with and um, that I think has to be removed. And that is that number six, if you look at the, and I guess we don't wanna get into a long discussion right now, but there's the one about merging systems. Mm -hmm. And what's really important is that it, it's got a formula for how we would allocate costs, how would we, we, would, we would do that. But right now we're talking about, uh, this issue comes up very, very significantly on the West Side water system. And we've had serious discussions about this. And what we're doing is we're, we've got an MOU being developed to figure out what are the principles under which we will develop a formula. So we, we can't be coming up with a formula right now. And I actually, reading the formula, I disagree with bits of it, but I don't wanna go into that now. But we can't be coming up with a formula before we've even had um, uh, the completion of the MOU which would tell us what the principles for the, and the foundation for the formula would be. We, this would be a slap in the face for the folks who are working on that right now. So that piece number six on how we merge systems should be deleted right now, please. And we, we need to wait until this MOU has been done. We understand what the principles will be and then we work on that. And um, it's a very sensitive topic. We have to be careful how we do it. So otherwise, um, it's great. Agreed, it's agreed David, thank you. And I, I think we should push this back to the next meeting. Otherwise, uh, especially at this time of night, it's gonna need some serious consideration. Put it on early in the uh, program so we can have a real good run at it. Our little committee of the whole meeting in advance of the meeting. Yeah, we could do that too, absolutely. Right about a committee of the whole. This is hard and it's got details in it and it needs to be really thought through carefully. Yeah, and we need no, to be agreed. able to hear. So I move okay. that the um, motion uh, be, that the discussion and the motion be postponed until the next regular count meeting. I'll second that. Yeah. Thank you, all in favor, aye. Opposed, no. 
Thank you. Uh, okay, so now we have the, we've got uh, two- 8.4. Sorry? 8.4. Yeah, I know that. I just, uh, I'm just looking at what else we have. We have 8.5, we have 11.1 of the updates. Um, let's just say it's 9.25. Uh, Maureen, go ahead. Not hearing you. Thank you. I'd like to move the recommendation for item 8.4. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 And if I, okay. could read, if I could just read the motion so it's on the audio, that yeah. to approve the expenditure of $8,800 for the hazardous areas work plan to be funded from the Council Strategic Initiatives Reserve Balance. Yeah. And that passed unanimously, I believe. Yeah, yeah. it did. Okay. Thank you. Okay, 8.5. And uh, is everybody willing to go ahead here for a little while? 15 minutes, say maybe we can do it. Yep. And it looks good. Okay. I think it's fairly straightforward. It's okay. I'll Patrick, move. it's all yours. Okay. Okay. Well, I, it's um, essentially wanted to provide an update on the water systems improvement projects and the consultations we've been having with the water system local advisory, com advisory committees, the LACs. Okay. Um, so we've met with, we've had our, um, working with our consultant team completed the concept design and analysis of options, the first phase of the project and met with all of the LACs. We met with Eagle Cliff and Cove Bay as a joint meeting. Um, short uh, story there is the out, uh, the outcome of that was that we were going to defer proceeding with detailed design um, for the improvement works, which are likely to consist of a, um, a water main connection between north end of the Cove Bay system and Eagle Cliff uh, and a new reservoir tank um, at the same site as the high zone tank. Um, and that would serve the Eagle Cliff um, and north end of the Cove Bay system. Uh, but since we've applied for the grant uh, under the Canada Infrastructure Program that we're probably not gonna hear about until end of summer or early fall, um, any work we do before we hear about that isn't eligible. So um, the downside is that, well, we're not moving forward and that defers having an actual solution in place, but that's what, um, that's the route we're taking there. Okay. Um, for uh, Tunstall Bay, we did look at the possibility of whether it made sense to share reservoir storage and link the, that system with the other west side systems. And because of the topography and distance, it, it really doesn't. So they did agree that we pr proceed to the next phase of work for them, which would be design of a new reservoir. Um, uh, probably in the 600 cubic meter range. Um, also uh, to proceed with um, water quality risk screening assessments that um, Vancouver Coastal Health recommended we do and uh, carrying out a similar um, aquifer and well study that was as was done for the, um, the aquifer that supports the other west side systems. And as um, David mentioned earlier, uh, Liam and I are, are meeting regularly with the three, the chairs of the Bowen Bay, um, King Edward Bay and Blue Water LACs to come up with a memorandum of understanding um, that will establish guiding principles for, for how we move forward. So we are uh, making some headway, but we're, we're not there yet um, and don't have a, MOU that we can share with council, but uh, will when we do. Um, so that's the, the other part of this report was essentially to get council um, authorization to apply for two more of these infrastructure planning grants. Uh, same program that we applied for the Eagle Cliff planning work. Um, one for the um, Tunstall Bay Aquifer study and another to support the um, 
uh, ongoing planning and analysis of options for the improvements to the resource management and infrastructure and operations of the West Side water systems. Fabulous. Um, you want to uh, do that now? We, we got a, we've got two motions, which um, do I have to read them? Well, it's just that, yeah. Okay. Um, I do have a question on number two, but I'll read number one and we can get it out of the way first. The okay. council approves the following um, recommendations from the water system local advisory committees um, for Eagle Cliff slash Cove Bay to defer proceeding with detailed design of improvements work for the Eagle Cliff Cove Bay water systems until fall 2021, subsequent to the announcement of the investing in Canada infrastructure program, rural and Northern communities, ICIP RNC grant result. B, Tunstall Bay to proceed with detailed design of a new reservoir, likely a 595 cubic meter glass fused bolted steel tank as recommended in the urban systems report dated February 12, 2021 at the current reservoir site and to keep the existing tank in service. Two, to conduct a water quality risk screening assessment as recommended by Vancouver Coastal Health. And three, to evaluate long-term sustainable yield of the Tunstall Bay Aquifer and optimize the op operation of the Tunstall Bay water system wells, and to request a fee proposal from urban systems to move forward with this work in accordance with phase two of BIM RFP 2020-020. And C, for Blue Water Park, Bowen Bay, and King Edward Bay to develop a memorandum of understanding between the three LACs and Bowen Island Municipality that defines high level objectives and establishes guiding principles around resource sharing and cost allocations. So I'll make that motion. Okay, I'll okay. second that. Yes. Uh, any further discussion on that? David, you got your hand up? Oh yeah, that, do I have, am I muted or not? Um, no, you're okay. You're talking. Okay, good. No, I just wanted to thank staff for their work. This is great. I'm so pleased to see so much progress. So, this, you know, is, this, is, this is an amazing amount of progress. Oh yeah. We, okay. we had excellent, LAC meetings um, in the round, it went really well. So, um, well, that's great. You got to take it when you can get it. So, yeah. I'll ask yeah. the question all in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Okay, and, so uh, on, you want to deal with number two? On two, I've got a question as to why under B or why we're not applying for three infrastructure planning grants because Bowen Bay has sort of a totally separate set of things being all the infrastructure they need to put the pipes in the ground for fire hydrants and all that stuff, which to me is a, is a separate project from everything else. And therefore maybe we could apply for three. That sounds good, Allison, yeah. Yeah. Give it a try? We, we could, I, I, I don't think um, it's really separate, but um, we, we could frame it that way. Yeah, okay. Not really any downside. Okay. Um, so the council directs staff to apply for three infrastructure planning grants to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing's infrastructure planning grant program, IPGP to support the following projects. A, the evaluation of the long-term sustainable yield of the Tunstall Bay Aquifer and optimize the operation of the Tunstall Bay well system. B, further planning and analysis of operations to improve West water resource management infrastructure and operations of the West side water systems. And C, to plan for the upgrade of the water lines and fire protection for Bowen Bay? Uh, well, actually, I don't mean, I, the other systems have, I mean, Blue Water has the same needs to upgrade their water lines as well. So you know, why wouldn't- well, I thought it was only part of theirs and they had to do theirs anyhow in order to hook in with the new- I would, yeah, I would feel more comfortable well, I'll add D and Line change three two. to four. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how much um, design work. I, I think design work does fall under it, but it's not. Um, yeah, let's not get too carried away if we're going to end up. Oh, right. I'll leave it yeah, at I two. Think, I think, yeah. yeah, I think I think it would get into a situation where we also would have to then prioritize because we're submitting so many. Yeah. Okay, okay, so we're staying with A and B then in the two? Yeah, it's just going to be yeah. hard to figure out how to carve up the TAM in, in B. All right, I'll second that with the two. Uh, and uh, any further discussions? Sue Ellen, you got your hand up? Oh, sorry. 
Okay. It's great. Just, just to confirm, we are deleting that amendment that was just being proposed. No. No, we're just That's doing two I'm, as written. Yeah. yeah, as written. Thanks. And uh, I'll ask a question all in favor. Aye. Aye. That is unanimous. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Okay, that's really well done. And we're gonna move along here, right down to new business, number 11, ministry meetings. Liam, should we just, uh, do you have any comment on that or should we just read the recommendation? Uh, no comments. I'm happy to okay. defer if we're trying to, we're moving along well, right now. I think we've been through this. We'll see if everybody's happy with it. The council directs that the provincial staff to establish meetings with the following Ministries, the Honorable Josie Osborne, Minister of Municipal Affairs, the Honorable Katrine Conroy, Minister of Forest Lands, Natural Resources, Operations and Rural Development, and the Honorable Nathan Cullen, Minister of State for Lands and Natural Resource Operations, and the Honorable Ravi Kalan, 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 Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation. I move that. Okay. Thank you, Allison. And any further discussion on this? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Again, unanimous. Thank you. If we can get through these updates and get the council, maybe we can get out of here by midnight. <laughs> well, no, 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 don't say that. I'll get my no. sleeping bag out shortly. Update the council, Metro Vancouver business. David? I got nothing, Gary. Had no meeting, got meeting this Friday, so no report. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Update Council Island Trust business. Trustees Fast and Kale. Go ahead, Michael. You know, um, I think there is nothing that's going to wait for two weeks in the scheme of things. Okay. So I okay. will. Prefer. I'll just mention two things really quickly. One of them okay. is uh, that Islands Trust met with Minister uh, Josie Osborne uh, last week and uh, discussed uh, tools for forest protection and things like that. I can give you more information if you'd like to know. And uh, item 12.2 in the council agenda in information items is a, a letter, um, Islands Trust doing advocacy against the Trans Mountain Pipeline in order to protect our marine environment. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Sue Ellen. Nothing from Michael, so we'll move on to the update to Council Metro Vancouver Regional Parks Committee meetings. Councillor Nicholson. Nothing to report. Thank you, Maureen. Update to Council on TransLink's Mayor's Council meeting, Councillor Allison Morris. Nothing to report. Thank you, Councillor Morris. And we're going to move to a closed meeting. The recommendation is Council move to a closed meeting immediately following the regular Council meeting to discuss items pursuant to Section 90-1A and J of the Community Charter. I'll move. That and second, sorry. Uh, Michael, I got, and all in favor? Aye. And then we're going to go down through here. So we get the question period. And uh, there's no questions. Hope. Oh, is anybody uh, online there? No. Nope. Very good. And this meeting is adjourned, and we're 38 minutes over time. So that's not too bad. Thank you very much, everybody. We're going to move to a closed meeting. And so and we sign off and sign in again? Yes, I guess so. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. I might have to go to the other computer again. Uh, so do you want to take it through?